Tuesday, June the 2nd. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of That's What G Said Podcast. Before we get into uh, many of the, the sports and the, the, the segments that we, we talk about, just wanted to mention everything going on um, in the world right now after the, the murder of, of George Floyd. We have protests all over. Uh, hopefully everybody stays safe. I completely understand the protests. Um, I, as to be honest, I as a, a pretty privileged white guy growing up, I I think I can do more by listening at a time like this than actually speaking anything out because I think sometimes it comes off a little disingenuous or maybe um, kind of uh, tone deaf if I'm if I'm up here kind of preaching or saying anything. All I know is um, w- what's happening in the world is not right, and I need to listen um, to make sure that me and our future generations are doing a much better job than we've done so far. So. Uh, very sad with everything going on in the world, but uh, I think there's really only one side to be, um, and it's obviously the side uh, against racism and, and everything happening. So, uh, so unfortunate to see all of that, and um, hopefully we can continue to uh, to move forward. It's it's just been an unbelievable um, and a horrible 2020 so far, and it's never easy to you know move on from a super serious topic into you know, talking about sports news and horse racing and other stuff here. But I think what my job is in a time like this is someone who can try to continue to entertain and continue to inform you and maybe give you a little bit of escape from from some of the things going on out there, not to forget, um, but just to be able to kind of have some some semblance of normalcy uh, in a time where, where there are, uh, are just a lot of um, unfortunate things going on in the world. So, I'm, I'm going to listen to every uh, what people are saying out there, and I'm going to do uh, my best to just continue to be a, a better person each and every day. Okay, this episode of That's What G Said, we are going to talk some NFL news, some baseball news, some Belmont Park. It is opening day on Wednesday at Belmont Park, June the 3rd. So David Aragona, the man who makes the morning line at Belmont Park and at the New York Racing uh, Tracks, is going to join us. We talk about, I think, four races from the Wednesday card. We talk about three more races from the Thursday card. The really good races we dive into. Sean Alvarez joins me to handicap the Churchill Thursday card. And then we're going to give you a recap of Billions. So you get some Belmont, you get some Churchill, you get a good TV show recap, and some NFL news and some baseball news. We are going to bounce all around on this episode of That's What G Said podcast. If you've been following along, we are currently doing the Best Football Movies podcast. We had a bracket that started with 64 of the best football movies out there, and we are now down to the Elite Eight. If you want to play along, it this is all just fun. You know, I, I put up all the polls on on my Twitter, so if you can follow me, head on over. It's me, Gino B. Let's get, get get some of the plugs out there right now too, if you can. Hey, if you're listening to this, go to YouTube and just click subscribe for me, and that way every time we do an episode, it'll automatically get sent to you, even if you're not gonna listen all the time or to everyone. It'll just send them to you, and that way you can pick and choose where you want. I'm trying to get those subscriber numbers built up on YouTube. If you can subscribe on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. Tune in, Spreaker. We are all over the place. You know those nice five star ratings and reviews. Those really, those really help us quite a bit. As uh, we always want to be able to continue to do more and more content for you. So if we're able to get more subscribers, more clicks, more listens, that just means we're able to get an extra sponsor or two and continue to do more content, always free for you listening. And uh, we can continue to pump out stuff like the best football movies bracket, where in the Elite Eight, the number one seed. We really didn't seed them like one through sixty four. What I did was based on you know reading through some lists, looking through all of your tweets and Facebook messages and all of the posts out there from from you who um, were able to answer in and, and mention some of your favorite football movies. I, I ranked them that way: who showed up the most, where they should be. So remember, the Titans and Brian Song were basically the one and two. Rudy was like the three. And honestly, I thought the blind side was the four, and the blind side got upset very early. So let's kind of go through the bracket real quick. Remember the Titans is the first of the Elite Eight, and remember the Titans beat the Comebacks in round one, 
then beat Gridiron Gang in round two, and then it beat Draft Day. 86% of the vote to 14% of the vote. So remember, the Titans is into the Elite Eight, where it will face Booby, Miles, and Friday Night Lights. And Friday Night Lights... Let's let's take a look at Friday Night Lights journey. It defeated Father was a fullback, then it defeated the original longest yard, and then it got by We Are Marshall in a really tight 53% to 47%. Friday Night Lights is on to the Elite 8 where it faces what in my opinion was the number 1 overall seed in the tournament, Remember the Titans. The so we'll go through the bracket and then on the next episode we're gonna actually um, break break down the movies a little bit more. I'll, I'll kind of you know get into each of the movies. We'll sell you on why we like them, why we don't like them, why they should move on, and then it all comes down to you. You guys are the ones voting, so I, I have no say in in who wins and who, who moves on because I can't even vote. Once I put the polls up, I have no sh- um I, I'm eliminated. I can't I cannot vote from my own uh, polls that I've created. So. Remember the Titans, Friday Night Lights, those are the first two that are in. Varsity Blues, number three, that's the third of the Elite Eight. Varsity Blues defeated 23 Blast, then it defeated two for the money, and then 61% of the vote to 39% of the vote, Varsity Blues got by The Replacements, which was one of my personal favorites, The Replacements. But Varsity Blues, which I watched last night, damn good movie. Looking forward to uh, talking a little bit more about that movie in depth on the next episode. In that Semi, what, quarterfinal? It'll be Varsity Blues versus Necessary Roughness. Necessary Roughness, in my opinion, had the toughest road to get to this Elite Eight. And Necessary Roughness beat Triumph of the Heart, then upset the blind side, and then defeated the program. 54% of the vote to 46% of the vote. Fumble freaking Ruski. Necessary Roughness in the Elite Eight. So on the other side of the bracket, Brian Song has really crushed. Brian Song went by Woodlawn easily, then defeated the new version of the Longest Yard, and then crushed everybody's All-American, 92% to 8%. Brian Song is on to the Elite Eight. Jerry Maguire will lock up with Brian Song. Uh, on the road to getting to the Elite Eight, Jerry Maguire defeated Newt Rockney, All-American, then the freshman, and then defeated Little Giants, 74% of the vote to 26% of the vote. Jerry Maguire is on. Another one who's sort of been an upset, the water boy into the Elite Eight. So I, this is, you know, it's a, it's a Sandler movie, but this is a good movie. I think the, be- the best Sandler movies are the ones that have a good story, have a little, he can kind of maybe play a little bit more of a character, and this is what he does with Bobby Boucher here. Um... The Waterboy defeats All Things Fall Apart, then defeats The Express, and then 73% of the vote to 27%. It upsets North Dallas 40, who I thought was going to be, you know, uh, a movie that would have at least made it into the Elite Eight. But the Waterboy in there, and the Waterboy will face the final member of the Elite Eight, and that's Rudy. Rudy, who defeated the quarterback then radio, and then 54% to 46 in a pretty tight matchup against any given Sunday. Rudy wins, and Rudy is on. So your Elite Eight one more time is Remember the Titans versus Friday Night Lights. The winner of that will play, uh, will face the winner of Varsity Blues and Necessary Roughness. On the other side of the bracket, it's Brian Song versus Jerry Maguire, and the winner of that matchup will face either the Waterboy or Rudy. That is the Elite Eight for the That's What G Said Best Football Movies podcast. While we're talking football, let's uh, let's talk some NFL news. So we have some rule changes this year to discuss. Um, the first one, the automatic replay review. So what um, this first ruling does is it's going to expand the automatic replay to all scoring plays, turnovers negated by a foul, or any successful or unsuccessful try attempt. Those plays may be reviewed regardless whether a foul is committed on the play. If accepted, it would negate the on-field ruling. And the replay official may only challenge a play until the next legal snap or kick. The replay official may consult with the designated member of the officiating department at the league office regarding whether to challenge a play. The second one, uh, defenseless player protection. So this is now going to expand defenseless player protection to a kickoff or punt returner who is in possession of the ball but who has not had time to avoid or ward off 
the imp- any impending contact, uh, contact from an opponent. So there's a lot of things that that fall under this one, obviously, but it's pretty self-explanatory. Hitting the defenseless players or head or neck area, lowering the head, making forcible contact, um, illegally launching into a defenseless opponent, um, uh, a runner who's in the grasp of a tackler who is forward progress already been stopped, kick off or punt returner attempting to field a kick in the air who has not had time to clearly become a runner, player on the ground, lots of different ways. For that, but they've expanded it, which is always a positive, right? We want um, what's an th- that's one of the the trickier things to to call too. But but it, when it's when it's a returner, I think it's a little bit different than someone in the middle of the play. It's so hard in the middle of a play when when someone's you know you know moving out of the backfield and they you know they duck and a player who is already in like midair trying or tackling um, has to kind of readjust. On the fly, that's just so difficult. I think sometimes there aren't, you know, um, you know, n- intent to try to do necessarily one of those head. Some players do, right? Some players, you know, what they're doing. You know, they're head hunting. But other players, it's hard. You could tell they're they're just kind of caught in between. But I think the more we can do to make this game safer is always positive. The fun uh, next one is one that Bill Belichick is. I guess maybe he's gonna like. Maybe he's not gonna like. He used to. Um, abuse the game clock manipulation rule. Remember where um, he could run clock, run time off the clock without having to, you know, run plays. It was a loophole. There's actually an article about it. That I'm gonna reference a little bit here. This was on Yahoo Sports, and um, it was he he used this during an AFC game uh, East game last year between the Jets and the Patriots. He was facing a punting situation with a running clock in Jets territory, and he took a delay a game penalty to give the the punter more room. Gase declined the penalty for the Jets, and then Belichick ordered an intentional false start on the next snap after running down the play clock. Gase also declined the penalty, and so Belichick ends up coming ahead. He ended up burning more clock on the exchange. It was a use of a false start instead of another delay of game, and it made sure that the Patriots would be penalized only 5 yards instead of 15 for the unsportsmanlike conduct uh, penalty that would have had for from a second consecutive delay of game. And Belichick even references this, says you know, we were able to run quite a bit of time off the clock without really having to do anything. It's a loophole that'll be closed and probably should be closed, but right now it's open. Remember, this is the, what happened and backfired against him in the playoffs against Tennessee when... Uh, his former player, Vrabel, used this against him. Titans were leading 14-13 in the fourth quarter. And they had a fourth and five at the Patriots 36. And they took a delay a game penalty after burning 40 seconds. And Belichick declined, uh, declined the penalty. And then Vrabel called for an intentional false start on the next play after running off another 40 seconds. So he got a little taste of his own medicine. And of course, that was in in a playoff game. So that was... Hugely important So the rule has changed because now it prevents teams From manipulating the game clock by committing Multiple dead ball fouls while the clock Is running No more of that for Belichick um, But I guess nobody can use it uh, Against him either Um, Some approved Bylaws in the NFL rule Changes too they were increasing the number of players Who may be designated for return from Two to three um, that's going to incorporate interpretations that are applicable uh, to bye weeks during the regular season and postseason. So what that means is a player placed on IR is not eligible to return until eight games, not eight weeks anymore, have elapsed since being placed on IR. So, some rule changes in the NFL. How about some uh, NFL news? We got some really good early feedback from a lot of the Browns players and their staff about their new coach Kevin Stefanski and what's funny is I don't know if that was that's always been the case immediately with some of the Browns hires or some of the Browns you know draft picks he wasn't Stefanski the new head coach he's not even able has not even been wasn't able get it get it out you know right he he is was not able to even move to Cleveland from Minnesota until you know pretty recently his o- OC and DC, the offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator, they have not moved from their previous spots in, in, in San Francisco, Cincinnati. And everyone that talks about Kevin mentions a few things. That he seems to be very sharp and that he seems to be 
very, very good at communicating, getting his message across. And one phrase that kept popping up in this ESPN article I was reading from Jake Trotter um, was same page. Baker Mayfield. I mean, you gotta remember, this is his fourth head coach going into his third NFL season. He says that Kevin Stefanski is, quote, able to relate to everybody. And Stefanski did fly to Texas just before the coronavirus outbreak, and he met with Baker, and Baker was very impressed with him. The coordinator, uh, Joe Woods, says that Stefanski's, quote, authentic and a straight shooter. And, you know, Bill Callahan said his ability to communicate and connect even via Zoom calls is outstanding. They, Their staff didn't even start until the first week in February as a staff, and they were at the Combine, and then shortly in mid-March, um, everybody had to go their separate ways. He said, I'm so impressed with his ability to communicate his message and his mission to the team. It's been well-received. That That's something that you like to hear popping up over and over and over again. Um it says Mayfield and wide receiver Jarvis Landry praised how smoothly Stefanski has been in operating in concert with Van Pelt and wide receivers coach Chad O'Shea. Landry calling it all very helpful. And it seems as though Andrew, Kevin, and the whole staff have gotten on the same page personnel-wise. Keep in mind, I mean, this is a loaded team with talent. Good good article from last week, you know, that, that points out all of their... You got Odell Beckham Jr., you got Jarvis Landry... You got Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt in the backfield. Now your offensive line, you added Jack Conklin and Jedrick Willis Jr. And you've got Austin Hooper now to help you out as a uh, a tight end who can make plays. This team, with the right coach, with the right staff, could be a very good football team. Some news out of San Francisco. D. Ford underwent extensive knee surgery after the Super Bowl. And this, this should be a positive for D. Ford, who has been... You know, dealing with tendonitis for a long time. This is a Nick Wagner um, article on ESPN that I'm going to be reading from a little bit here. Ford revealed last week he underwent a pretty extensive cleanup surgery on his left knee. Or Dr. James Andrews said he had a severe case, uh, severe case of tendonitis, and he said that's basically like a blown tire with the the position that I play. Now I'm able to actually explode off the knee. Said it had to be surgical, um, but I didn't want to miss the season. San Francisco was having a, such a good season last year. He didn't want to have surgery and then end his season when he knew this was a type of team that had the opportunity to win a Super Bowl, and we saw them get there and have a very, very good year. They don't really know the timetable for uh, his rehab. He said the tendonitis has been a chronic issue, hard to determine when or if it will return because of the pandemic. Um, they have... Not really had the chance to test the knee in football situations, so he said. I, D Ford said, "I know what I felt like last year, and doing the things I'm doing now, it's like night and day." He said we haven't really had an off season. No one's really been in competition, so it's been really hard to measure where you're at. So we're going to take it one day at a time and just keep getting this thing as strong as we possibly can to get it, so we can sack some quarterbacks. He said the knee has plagued him for many of his previous six um, seasons in the NFL. But that's the unfortunately that's the thing with him. He was still so good when he was on the field. He just wasn't able to stay on the field all the time, and that's what hopefully the surgery will be able to do. Not have to have him go on and off as much as he did during the regular season. The Niners had 24 sacks on 164 snaps when Bosa and Ford were on the field together. They had 24 sacks on the 801 snaps on all other plays. So having Ford and Bosa on the field together is the key to success for them. Ford had 6.5 sacks, 2 forced fumbles in 11 regular season games, but he was only able to average 21.9 snaps per game. And he declined to have the knee worked on so he could attempt to still help the team and not have to miss the uh, the season but he said that having to go back and forth and the fact that he couldn't stay on the field all the time was frustrating. He's now hoping the surgery will give him a shot to play a more prominent role on the D-line that has become the focal point of the team. And he's going to be expected to even step up and fill more of a role with uh, Buckner gone this year. So Ford could be even stronger this year if able to just uh, rehab nicely. He could be on the field more than we saw him last year and maybe even uh, even feeling better with a little more bounce than we've seen from him in the last few years. Melvin Gordon takes a shot at the Chargers uh, last week. He said, 
The Chargers' home games prepped him for playing with games, uh, playing games with no fans. He said he's not concerned if fans can't be in stands when the NFL season begins because he's already dealt with that. This is an ESPN article from uh, from last week, and he said the past three years with the Chargers in Los Angeles, bro, we didn't have any fans anyways. Quote. We didn't have many Chargers fans at the game. I'm just going to be honest. We didn't have many Chargers fans at the game. Much loyalty love, but we didn't have many. So I'm not missing anything. He's not wrong. He's not wrong. Uh, the Chargers home stadium has an NFL low capacity of 27,000 fans. So Gordon, who is now going to be uh, a rival with the Denver Broncos, I'm not sure who the the heart and soul of the Chargers that might take that personally is, but... Um, that might be fun to see when they lock up uh, Chargers Broncos later this year. So we have had uh, another rule change in pass interference. Replay is gone. I mean, this rule was awful last year. This is a uh, an article I'm reading through from Kevin Seifert, who said the rule failed so miserably in the words of the league executive vice president Troy Vincent that it won't even as much appear on the agenda for the owners' conference call to vote on rule proposals. So, what what basically what ends up happening is it's really hard for subjective calls to be reviewed because it puts somebody in a weird spot and they've got to figure out a better way of doing this. Owners have put a place put in place a preseason experiment to text their next idea. Expanded communication between existing replay assistant in the press box and the replay and the referee on the field with a much more limited menu of calls available for consultation. Barring a reversal born of the same impatience that fueled the 2019 pass interference review failure, a true sky judge won't even be considered for the regular season until 2021. That's what's going to make things difficult is, in the NFL, we need to have a system of some checks and balances, and and if it's not going to be via the coaches, it has to be via one maybe ref or, or official who's overseeing everything and has to just say that is not... That is, that's a terrible call. We have to overturn this. That has to be changed. It, there's too many games that get ended or that get drastically changed on one play or the next. That's just a bad call. We've seen it over the last... It's It's been forever in sports, but it's become worse over the last five years because now we have better technology than we've ever had. We're able to see things that we've never seen. We're able to use cameras in spots all over the field, all above the field, below the field, to where there should not be mistakes that were made 10, 15, 20 years ago. And unfortunately, it becomes an ego thing now. When it's a subjective calls, referees make calls, they don't want to be overturned, they don't want to overturn their buddy, they don't want to look stupid, and so they don't end up doing it. And that, that needs to change because we need to have the the integrity of the game and the results of this game not being drastically changed by dumb, idiotic penalty calls. This is getting back to that article. It says, so there's going to be at least two seasons without an effective response to the problems that were revealed by the missed pass interference foul in the 2019 NFC Championship game. The state of NFL officiating requires a safety net just to give it a chance to be consistently good. And we got to be honest, it's hard, right? We're at home watching things on an HD camera. Sitting there, we're able to pause and rewind over and over. So if when officials and referees make mistakes in live time, I can get that. I cannot get making a mistake and then not correcting it after watching it on video replay. That just doesn't sit with me. That doesn't sit with people who, if you're a player, you know, winning and losing or a coach winning and losing a game or two or bonuses, extra yards, penalty calls, things like that. That affects your contract and your money down the line. That affects your livelihood. So that that to me is the most important. And then think about it from like a grand sense, right? All the customers out there who are watching, who are either betting or who are playing fantasy football or even fans who are invested. It's so frustrating when you know you feel wrong, when you are Looking at the and going, this was wrong. This was a bad call. I'm losing because of a bad call. Because when we're gambling and when we're playing fantasy and stuff, we're probably going to lose a lot more than we win, anyways. It doesn't. It's not fun to feel like you're getting screwed. And that's what's been happening in the NFL a lot, way too much over the last few years. Um, 
Some quote says that an eighth official upstairs is going to allow this game to flow. He's going to buzz that buzzer when he feels a certain level of mistake has been made. But there's no reason to think that a sky judge would work any better than a replay review of pass interference. In kneecapping and ultimately sabotaging last season's rule, the league proved unwilling or unable to do the work of defining what a certain level of mistake is, right? Yeah, that's the problem, too. They just didn't want to go deeper into it. They didn't want to break it down a little bit more. The league entered 2019 league meetings with uh, sharply divided on what, if any, response was required due to uh, was required to the championship game missed the year before. The committee had long resisted reviewing subjective decisions, so they didn't want to review subjective decisions forever because they don't want to be proven wrong. And so they, it was like we didn't want this rule to begin with, so we're just going to sabotage this rule from the beginning. The Canadian Football League actually has picked up this rule And it's taken them a few years to get it Kind of figured out Commissioner Roger Goodell Pushed through the experimental one year rule There were plenty of doubters Most notably competition committee chairman Rich McKay He said I'm not sure that we that when we set it up We didn't know that the result could go this way Because reviewing subjected fouls Is going to create disagreement in my mind The key to success was establishing a reasonable standard for the level of contact required to add a foul in review or take a flag off the field. And, I mean, the NFL ended up putting that job in the hands of Senior Vice President Officiating Al Riveron, whose authority extended to making the final call on every replay review from the league's New York Command Center. And it, it started right away. Right, I'm continuing through this uh, this ESPN article from Kevin Seifert, who he talked about. You know, week two, he failed to add a flag to an obvious miss in a Monday Night Football game between the Eagles and the Packers. Most of the season, Riveron appeared to be using an impossible high standard for overturn. After speaking with two knowledgeable officiating sources, independently identified about 50 pass interference calls that Riveron judged incorrectly. Or on any reasonable scale of review The NFL reviewed 101 pass interference calls Or non-calls and they overturned 24 Some of the executives From the CFL, the Canadian Football League Said it took them about 3 years before they found a comfortable Standard for reviewing pass interference NFL could not be that patient The theory behind what the league Voted on certainly had a chance to be successful But honestly it wasn't ready uh, They weren't ready in New York to handle it and it sounds critical, but that's just a fact. Consistency and the ability to take in the calls at least come up with a fairly level basis of what we're going to interpret that call on. This is good. This is a good article too. I mean, it says a classic case of of preferring the appearance of a solution rather than doing the hard work of building one that would work. Doubling down on a sky judge too soon would risk a repeat of that disaster from last year, where we just. We all felt like like nasty, right? We all felt like we were watching something that was bigger than what was actually happening on the field, and it was like a bunch of guys dealing with ego stuff. So now the NFL's focused its offseason on realigning the leadership structure that continu- uh, that contributed to the problem. It's demoted Riveron, replaced him with a committee of executives who all report to Vincent, um, longtime assistant coach Perry Fuel, joined the league office in a role. That league sources described as supervising The officiating department's day-to-day operations Uh, Retired referee Walt Anderson Was hired as senior vice president of training and development He's assumed control over the tasks Normally charged to the NFL's officiating chief um, Hiring and firing And crew assignments He's running the day-to-day operations And he might He'd be the bridge to the next generation of leadership For the officiating department no matter what they know that replay review of pass interference is dead As is the likelihood of any near future expansion Into reviewing subjective calls Folks don't like being uh, being checked and balanced Do they? Last bit of uh, NFL news that I wanted to get to It's more of a, like a profile on Josh Allen And it's pretty good It's from uh, Marcel Louis Jacques And it's on ESPN And it talks about him trying to continue to improve and take the next step forward this year and it should be a no excuses kind of year they've added Stefan Diggs so now they've got Diggs John Brown Cole Beasley they've got Singletary drafted another back 
if he can improve from from year two to year three, like he did from year one to year two, this is his third year under the offensive coordinator. He makes them into a legitimate contender. So some negatives, right? He had the lowest completion percentage in the NFL last season for the second year in a row. But he did move up from 52.8% to 58.8%. But he was only 26.5% completion percentage on passes beyond 20 yards, which is bad. It's really bad when you have two receivers like Brown and Diggs that can just stretch the field for you. So you have to become more accurate down the field now with those two. Diggs and Brown were third and seventh in touchdown receptions on passes traveling at least 20 air yards in the past two years. Last year, Diggs was first and Brown was third in touchdown receptions of 20 or more yards in the air. And Diggs was fourth in the NFL last year with an average of 17.9 yards per catch. He has got to be accurate down the field to be able to have a good marriage with these receivers. One of the things that um, had happened to Allen, they said, is in 2016 when he was starting at Wyoming, he was playing with some good pieces around him. Some of the skill position players were future NFL players. And then he, he did a good job of just letting the offense come to him. What ended up happening is in 2017 when all of those players went to the NFL and he was still at Wyoming... He ended up trying to do things a lot on his own They said playing, you know, hero ball And it's something that he had carried over into You know, his time in Buffalo And we can see those glimpses all the time Where he tries to extend plays He, instead of just throwing the ball away Or maybe running out of bounds He tries to do too much He takes a big hit He forces a ball into a spot You know, with double or triple coverage He said he needs to Make sure that the 10 other guys on the field They have to trust them They have to make plays And they have to do their job And After a really awful game Against the Patriots last year Over his next 12 games He only threw 3 interceptions And 17 touchdowns But then in the playoff game he kind of reverted back Against the Texans He fumbled on a lateral to the tight end He attempted a a long pass in double coverage But then, he, you know, it's like he makes a couple bad plays But then he brings them back He put them in position to tie the game late in the fourth They were in field goal position But then a bad penalty pushed them back He just, he has to be more consistent now With a good defense With some of the skill position players around To help him win games He just has to be the reason why Buffalo isn't losing games and they feel like they've put him in position now They've put the pieces around him on the roster To give him a major chance to succeed He has to make sure that he cannot You know Try to run up the middle sometimes And get a you know a helmet to helmet hit And then a concussion like, it, like happened last year And then force him out He's one of only four quarterbacks in NFL history To throw for 5,000 yards And to run for 1,000 In their first two seasons So they don't want him to stop running But he just has to be, as uh, this article says, more calculated with the risks. And they want to be able to be the type of team that can throw the ball if you need to, that can run the ball if you need to, just a versatile, well-built team. And on paper, they look, you know, like they have a major opportunity to make some noise this year. Let's move on over from football. To baseball, so some baseball news, and not a not a whole lot of it positive. Um, last week, going a lot of the baseball stuff I'm going to be uh, referencing here. I always try to like to if you if you get a chance to mention the the articles or some of the, the people where you get some of the information from or the websites or whatever. It's always good because it not only are you you know citing your sources, which is something we're taught to do when you're really young, but I think I like to hear when I'm listening to other podcasts and other shows. Where people do some of their research from Or, or things that they reference to if, Even if it's just as simple as this article This website um, and so and so So um, Jeff Passan's a really good follow um, Right now with all the, um, the The baseball news to keep an eye on Hundreds of minor league baseball players Were cut last week um, Hundreds more expected to lose their job As the sport grapples with the near certainty That the minor league season will be cancelled Players likely would have been released A lot of these players likely would have been released towards the end of spring training Even if baseball had not been halted by the the virus But the cuts 
will wind up more than a thousand. They could be the point where a lot of these players aren't getting other opportunities because there's no other baseball being played. There's no other minor league opportunities, right? The the minor league opportunities are so now few and far between. Owners of minor league teams have begun laying off front office and game day workers, citing the cancellation of the season as the reason. Minor league baseball season has not officially been canceled, though the suspension of professional baseball agreement that governs the minor league's relationship with Major League Baseball precludes the big league's organizations from providing players to their minor league affiliates. Commissioner Rob Manfred said he would inform minor league baseball if and when the players would be allowed to join affiliated teams. Even with no players available, teams acting as if the season is over, one team is renting out their stadium on Airbnb. And minor league uh, baseball president Pat O'Connor has yet to speak publicly and acknowledge the foregone conclusion for 2020. For more than a year, baseball has planned to con- to contract about a quarter of the minor league teams before 2021. They wanted a drastically shorter amateur draft, which they've got now. It's only five rounds this year instead of the typical 40. There's going to be delay in international free agent signings till as late as January 15th. There are going to be really small, thin minor league systems. The further pay cuts and... Are related to the elimination of affiliates and leagues in 2020. They could be expected into the future, so even more cuts and more pay cuts. Some veteran players released could compete for jobs on the 20 man taxi squad that every major league team will field if a season begins. But the younger players cut, they might have more difficulty finding jobs and opportunities because they're not going to be able to necessarily produce at the big league level right now. They need to find spots where they can grow. Teams have agreed to play minor leaguers $400 a week in April and May to cover wages lost because of canceled Nick games. Um, we've seen some players like David Price step out and help give a little more to a lot of the minor leaguers in some of the systems, but I mean, this this is not good. The Oakland A's told their minor league players they would no longer receive the stipend starting in June. Um, you know, it's just kind of like on a team-by-team case on who's been been able to continue to help provide like the White Sox, they're providing stipends to 25 minor league players recently released Phillies you know, Dodgers, Mets, White Sox Tampa, Rangers, Orioles are going to do so through June, it's just it's unfortunate and and then what, so what does this mean for minor league baseball and for baseball going forward I mean there's no chance there's going to be minor league baseball this season and so what do the players do? This is, you know, Brad Doolittle and Jesse Rogers who kind of go back and forth on ESPN and they, they talk about how some of them will be, you know, able to play in the spring facilities. Others might be part of the extra group of players who are around the big league team, but not on the initial roster. Um, it's just not going to be a season like they've ever had. The top prospects, are they going to be pushed in this kind of a weird season? Probably not. Um, and if you're like a low, low tier player, you're probably going to be let go. It says top prospects could get some work in some part of the Arizona Fall League. They could also get in work at MLB Spring Training. Some will be needed for expanded rosters and the proposed taxi squads. It, but it's basically a lost year for players in the age range during which they are most apt to improve. It's like a, unfortunately, like a wasted year in a big. Developmental year and what should be a big developmental year for many of these players. Minor league players literally have no voice in any of these talks, and some teams have done a better job than others. Um, it looks worse now. Maybe guys cut in March would then it then if you know then if there were regular baseball where after spring training a ton of these guys would have gotten cut anyways because they can't find jobs so. Rogers is mentioning that it really is as bad as it sounds. This is taking things to a different level of like not able to go out on your own. You're just not even getting the opportunities. Um, and this only seems to be the first wave of more major cuts that are going to be be coming out. And the negotiations between Major League Baseball and the minor leagues have basically been non-existent. I mean, baseball right now is dealing with if the majors are going to get back 
they're not like I'm sure they're not even dealing at all with this minor league situation. Major League Baseball has wanted minor league baseball to be an affiliated system with 120 teams. We'll we'll, we'll see what ends up happening because we had a an awful proposal last week from the owners to the players on what they thought this season would look like and the players kind of laughed it off and so getting through that I mean baseball's always had a tough time of you know labor dis- 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 discussions disagreements back and forth um, it- they just suggested you know that instead of playing a prorated salary like they had agreed on they were going to cut the best pay the best players in baseball the highest paid players the most and the example was now keep in mind folks i know this sounds like a ton of money right we're like oh man they should all take cuts and stuff but these are players that are worth this kind of money and if you're mike trout and your prorated salary was supposed to be something like 19 million and now you're going to get 5 that's the I understand that's a lot of money. I'd love to make the five million, right? Most of us would die for the five million, but it's not about that, right? Most of us don't have the skills that Mike Trout does. Most of us don't sell the T-shirts, the jersey. We don't, you know, make people watch. We don't get people talking. We're not a multiple-time MVP. It's just, it's different, right? There, the the players make this much money because they can they can attract this much money. They're worth it, and um, I'm definitely on the side of the players in this, and I, I'm I'm definitely on the side in the fans in that I think. The owners need to use this time right now and serve at, as a as an investment. They need to think about who they're investing in right now. They're investing in the future. They're investing in the fans. They're investing in getting baseball on the TV right now when there's no other major team sports going on right now. We've seen horse racing. We've seen wrestling continue on. But we're going to see football. We're going to see basketball likely get back into the swing of things soon. And if baseball is not being played yet, and those two other sports are, by the time baseball comes back, it's going to be right where it's been lately. It's going to be behind them in terms of interest, in terms of views, in terms of people caring. They cannot try to cut their top tier players like the uh, the agreement that the owners uh, put forth last time out. So now the newest news which was just uh, I think Sunday night into Monday from Jeff Passan unable to reach a return to play agreement Major League Baseball has discussed playing a shorter season in which it would pay members of the MLB Players Association their full prorated salaries sources familiar with the situation told ESPN players have held out for a full prorated portion of their salaries based on the March 26th agreement with the league. And on Sunday, they proposed a 114 game schedule that would cover 70% of their original salaries. The owners want to play a 50 game schedule with full prorated that would pay the players 30% of that number. Based on the feedback received from the players association, the agreement reads the office of the commissioner will construct and provide to the Players Association as promptly as possible a proposed 2020 championship season and postseason schedule or multiple schedule options using best effort to play as many games as possible while also taking into account player safety and health, rescheduling needs, competitive considerations, stadium availability, and the economic feasibility of various alternatives. So, players, initially the owner said 82. Players came back with 114. Then the then the owners re- responded with a fifty ish game season, um, with with at least the the full prorated but less games. So you're getting on, on better on a per game basis. The league has contended it will lose money each game it plays without fans and with players making their full pro rate it has pushed for a shorter season because fears of a second wave of coronavirus potentially wiping out postseason and the revenue that comes with it. So baseball, not all that positive in the world of baseball. 
We are going to take a quick commercial break right now, and then when we return, it's going to be an interview with David Aragona, the man who makes the morning line at the NYRA. We're going to talk about racing back at Belmont Park. So we will discuss a couple races from Belmont Park on Wednesday. We'll discuss a couple races from Belmont Park on Thursday. So get your past performances out for Belmont. Kick back and enjoy this upcoming interview with David Aragona. Just wanted to remind you about one of the sponsors of That's What G Said podcast, Sarah Candle Company. Visit sarahcandles.com, C-E-R-A candles.com. Use the promo code G-I-N-O for 10% off of your entire purchase. These are all natural soy wax candle. They Candles, they burn longer. They are better for you than the candles out there that have that traditional paraffin wax. Uh, I know the people from this company personally. I've grown up with them my whole life. They love candles. And the goal was to, to have an affordable candle that everyone can and enjoy. Use that promo code G-I-N-O. My favorite is Fresh Roses. The Fresh Roses scent is awesome. If you're a horse racing fan, they got Del Mar in there. You ever want to know what Del Mar smells like, but you couldn't make it out there? Order your candle right now from Sarah Candle Company. The website C-E-R-A Candles.com. Sarah Candles.com. Promo code G-I-N-O for 10% off your purchase. We are very excited to have horse racing back. Yeah, the NYRA Belmont Park will be opening back up on Wednesday, June the 3rd. And if we're going to talk Belmont, no better man to talk the uh, the New York races with than the man who actually makes the morning lines there from Time Form US, does some work for DRF. It is David Aragona. David, how you doing today? Doing pretty good. It's great to be back on. and It's a fun week in horse racing with Belmont starting up. Yeah, it's it's been great over the last, you know, three weeks to a month. We've seen a lot of these big tracks, kind of like dominoes, start to fall again and, and get up and running with, with uh, Churchill and then with Santa Anita. And now we're back over to Belmont Park. And before we get into the uh, the first two cards of the season where we want to talk about Wednesday and Thursday, we, we did have some uh, unfortunate news this morning. You and I are recording this at around uh, 2 o'clock Eastern time or so, and not long before uh, we started talking, we found out that Arrogate uh, had passed away, and this is uh, a horse who, and when you talk about some of the greatest horses of the last decade, and maybe even some of the the horses who at their peak were as good as any we are probably talking about Arrogate, who is the Eclipse Award champion for 2016 for your three-year-old. He won the Breeders' Cup Classic that year, and he had a string of races that, I mean, five or six races from breaking his maiden to the Dubai World Cup, which included the Travers, that are as good as you may ever see. Yeah, he's kind of a funny horse that to assess from a historical standpoint, especially when we'll look back in time years from now, because his career really did end on a sour note. But mm-hmm. I think it would be remiss to to overlook just how good he was for that four race stretch from the Travers to the Breeders' Cup to the Pegasus to the Dubai World Cup. I mean, those four performances together and each of them individually were among the best performances that we've seen over the past couple of decades. I mean, and for me, at the top of the list is his Travers, because, I mean, it was the breakout performance you didn't really know what you were watching at the time uh obviously he just smashed the track record that day he set what seemed like a legitimate pace and somehow was able to run his final quarter mile in something like 23.7 seconds which is just mind-blowing at the end of a mile and a quarter race uh he was really something and it's just a shame that uh i think i guess we're only going to get uh, two crops of foals from him i i think uh we, we started to see some of his uh, progeny being born earlier this year. I don't know if he sired a crop this year, but uh, he would have been such an exciting stallion as a son of unbridled song. And it's just a shame, but uh, we can definitely look back at the replays of his performances and appreciate him. It's amazing. It's always hindsight when we look back. I was like, he was 11 to 1 in the Travers, you know, when he just crushed like that too. It's like, we didn't really know who this horse was yet at that time because he was kind of... He wasn't the normal Baffert horse that we were used to. Generally, these Baffert horses, they're really good at two or early, early on at three. We know right away who they are. He was a little bit late developing. He didn't even, you know, make any of the, the Triple Crown races. They they handled him a little bit different. And I guess it just goes to show you in horse racing that it, it not everything or every horse follows the same template because this just didn't seem like the typical Baffert. 
Yeah, he's like the quintessential example of a horse that wasn't running as fast as he needed to to win these, or was running just as fast as he needed to to win his early races. Because, I mean, he had earned some pretty impressive speed figures coming into that Travers, but not like the, I think it was a 120 buyer that he got for that race. And Baffert, in in hindsight, has said that, I mean... He knew what he had, but a lot of people apparently didn't know. I mean, he had been visually impressive in his races out in California, but I think nobody knew what was coming that day. And it's just pretty cool that he got to hold that form for even a few races because we just don't see that many horses posting the kind of speed figures that he did for that four-race stretch. Well, let's go uh, to the current time now, and let's talk about the the racing that's ahead of us. Um, really, un- unfortunately, when some of the racetracks have had to, to cancel and cut stakes races and uh, there haven't been as many days of racing, what ends up happening is when the racing does open back up, we get these very, very good racing cards like we've seen at Churchill Downs. We saw a couple at Santa Anita. Unfortunately, their, their fields weren't as great last the weekend, but these Belmont cards look really good. You get some of these, you know, first and second level allowance races that are as deep as stakes races because there's nowhere for these horses to run. And we just have a lot of, I think, in in Wednesday and Thursday, just a lot of interesting horses and a lot of interesting, um, you know, names of horses that we see maybe making a return. I mean, Wednesday, we have three or four really solid races. The one I want to begin with uh, to talk about is in race number three. So if you're out there listening and following along, get your past performances out. We're going to be looking at Belmont Park for June the 3rd, Wednesday, and we're going to get to race number three. We've got two-year-olds here, and we've got some fun names to deal with, uh, David. The, the football fans from the inside will like uh, Garoppolo, and then the, uh, the I, I guess, perfectly named by the time, Fauci, who is uh, going to be making his debut for Wesley Ward. And, you know... When we look at Wesley Ward and how he's done this year in particular with two-year-olds, it's been some mixed success. He's he's only won with a couple, I say with three. That's probably more two-year-olds than most people win with in a full year. But the the problem with the Wesley Ward runners that we see is that they're always going to take so much money. I think he's had 13, 12 or 13 runs so far. And uh, of two year olds this year, and the biggest price of any of them has been seven to two. So if they're not winning, they're burning a lot of money. I guess we have to start with Fauci in this race in here. Does he have to win this? Yeah, I mean, the depleted racing calendar has messed up a lot of trainer schedules, and that's certainly the case with Wesley Ward because he typically cleans up at that Keeneland meet, and they just mm-hmm. didn't hold the Keeneland meet this year. And uh, I've listened to a few interviews with Wesley Ward, and he was saying that uh, he kind of shipped some horses back down to Florida that he had taken away. Same thing with Churchill, and they're not his first string of two-year-olds. He hasn't started them yet. He said this is kind of a later developing group than what he usually sends to Royal Ascot. Uh, He's hoping to still send a few. And the name that he keeps mentioning is the horse that he's really looking to send to Royal Ascot is this horse, Fauci, even though he hasn't started yet. Uh, He's been pretty clear about saying this is the two-year-old he's looking forward to the most. I'm sure part of that has to do with the name because it's a horse that's easy to root for in that sense. Uh, But apparently he's worked really well. Um, I think that that 47 bullet that you see two back, that was in company with a horse named Gypsy. King, um, who I think was second recently in a maiden race of Churchill well, Downs, yeah. but but uh, apparently Fauci's been outworking a lot of those horses. It's interesting. He's got this gigantic turf pedigree on the bottom side really of his turf, pedigree. Right? Yeah. Yeah, very. The Dam's a half to X Celebration, who used to battle with Frankel as well as a Lancaster Bomber, who was a good horse for Aiden O'Brien. So if he eventually gets to Royal Ascot or one of these European meets in the future, I guess he would like that kind of going. But I mean, the word is out, so he's going to take a lot of money. Um, I don't know if he's the kind of horse I'd take a shot against because I don't know if there are really stories on the others, but obviously the Kelly Breen horse, Garoppolo, and Prisoner for Todd Fletcher, they'd be the two others in there. Yeah, it looks like the the two inside horses. I mean, Cassie, we know, has some sets. It's interesting to see, um, you know, we, we just talked about Arrogate a little bit. One of his big successes was in beating Exaggerator, and I think we're going to see, believe this is Exaggerator's first a uh, two-year-old runner in the number five indoctrinate here so we have it's kind of difficult when we're handicapping a race like this with a horse like indoctrinate who's coming out of a, a sire that's going to have their first runner and a dam that's going to have their first full so we from a just pure pedigree perspective we really don't know a whole lot about like the direct pedigree for this one Yeah, it's always cool to see these first crop sires get going because you just saw them on the racetrack, it feels like, not that long ago. Makes you feel old, doesn't it? (laughs) It it does. I mean, when it happens a lot now. Um, But uh, yeah, no, it's going to be interesting to see Exaggerator as a son of Curlin, so he certainly has the pedigree to be a nice sire. Yeah, and we we know Cassie can pop. They had a two-year-old filly named Beautiful Memories who won by 10 the other day at Churchill Downs. So with with the right type, they can absolutely fire. But we're all going to be kind of watching Fauci because, yeah, he's been a very buzzy horse 
um, in the last few weeks, and we'll see if Wesley Ward can get one of his best into the winner's circle right away. Let's move to race number six on Wednesday. This one starts the late pick five sequence, and I just thought this was a really good first level allowance race and a good one of those good like multi race exotic type races because I mean you you look at this field and if you made a case for any of seven or eight horses I wouldn't I wouldn't talk you off them David I mean you have passive uh interest uh passive investing from the inside who's lightly raced you have Medita who you know wins with a repeat of that August 18th performance most likely the new face in say hey X and Teak Kept really good company last year I mean you expect Fashion Star to probably improve Bariqua loves to win And then the two horses towards the outside Hungry Kitten and English Soul You could legitimately make cases for most in here So where do you start? Yeah, I think it's a pretty wide open race. I mean, for me, the horse to beat is probably the number one passive investing. Uh, The real concern, though, is that obviously she's the Chad Brown horse in these races, and they so often get bet down to prices that are a little bit unreasonable. That's just the curse of success with a barn like Chad Brown. Uh, But she ran really well to win that maiden race at Keeneland last year. She did not break well that day. She was wide for much of her trip. Uh, The horse that she held off in the late stage is Temple City Terror. Uh, She's come back to do some nice things against winners since then. Uh, Uh, So I just think passive investing is the horse to beat. We'll see which price she is. Um, Medita, I don't really know what to do with her because she looked okay at Saratoga. Her last race at Belmont was really disappointing, uh, but she's had a lot of time off since then. So I'm not sure what we're going to get from her. I think on the outside, the number 12 English soul is very interesting. I know she's never actually crossed the wire first on the turf, but all of her best speed figures have been earned on the turf. And her first start for this barn, Jack uh, Sisterson in the Cardinal last year, that was uh, her only only turf race for this new barn and it was arguably one of her best efforts uh, when she handled that boggy going down there uh, so I think she's got to be used though I think this is a race where you want to look for some value so the horse that I put on top is the number five Xanthique uh, I know she's got to get a little bit faster to beat this field but I liked her performance last summer in the risk averse where she got beaten by a couple of talented runners and catch a bit and Dalica and then since then she just missed hitting the board in a couple of races but she was hampered by a slow pace two back at Belmont And then last time at Keeneland, I think that allowance race has turned out to be a bit stronger than it seemed at the time, because obviously Zofel has come back to win stakes since then. Zuzana, who was third, she came back and won a stakes later in the year, I think at Del Mar. Uh, So that was a strong field, and just seems like Xanthik might sit a good stocking trip in this race. Yeah, and what we're going to see over the the first couple days of uh, the racing um, in particular, we see a lot of these import um, horses come in who are going to be making their first start in the U.S. That's going to be the the case with, uh, with Say Hey, who... He might be a little. Uh, she might be a little sneaky in here. Uh, you know, you, you go back and look at her last race. She was kind of in between in a lot of traffic. I don't think she really got a shot to really stretch her legs. It, obviously, gonna have to deal with the layoff. I just think this is kind of a. It might be a good spot to kind of jump into for uh, for a new face like say hey for top notch connection. So yeah, just a a really good race. And then even just to mention uh, um, Bariqua, a horse who loves to win. If if most if a lot of these come up a bit short and maybe they're looking for a race down the line or they've got bigger plans for the rest of the year, Bariqua could be a kind of horse who might be able to just win this race and and maybe not have the most upside as everybody else, but be kind of in the now form. So uh, I thought a really fun race to start that uh, that late pick five sequence in race number six on uh, on Belmont's opening ca- uh, day card. We then move to race number eight at Belmont, which is a second level allowance. And David, I think if you're someone who is on social media a lot for like horse racing Twitter and stuff like that, uh, which I know you and I both are, you you've probably had a discussion about. Hidden scroll one time or the next This seems to be one of the more polarizing Horses out there because There's no doubting that he has Tons of talent but he He doesn't really seem like the horse who likes To fight he's had some some Kind of weird races where he's gone a little too Fast it seems like they were trying to figure out What to do with him and now he's going to show up Making his first start on the grass What do you do with hidden scroll Yeah he's really the key to this race I think You have to have an opinion about him to play this Race um So I was a big fan of Hidden Scroll right from the start. I mean, I'm a big believer in speed figures, and he ran legitimately fast in that debut. That's still uh, one of the more impressive debuts that I've seen, especially for a horse going a route distance. Um, But Hidden Scroll as the dirt superstar just hasn't really panned out the way that a lot of us had hoped. But I was one of those people that even from the start, while 
I held out a lot of hope that he'd be a horse that might make it to the Kentucky Derby and maybe do well as a dirt miler later on. I was kind of concerned that maybe dirt might not be the preferred surface for him because you got to keep in mind, he won that debut over a sloppy, freshly sealed racetrack. That's the kind of surface that can sometimes favor horses with turf inclinations. Mm -hmm. And when you look at his pedigree, there really are a lot of grass influences in there. I mean, obviously, Hardspun is a decent grass sire. Uh, His damn Sheba Queen, she didn't do a whole lot of racing, um, but uh, she's out of a dam named Etoile Montant, who won a Group 1 turf race in in France. Uh, She was also a grade 2 winner in this country and the dam uh sheba queen she's a half sister to star former who was a good runner for i believe bill mott a few years ago winning multiple graded stakes on the turf and just when you watch hidden scroll run he's got this big lopy stride like seems like a turf horse to me um so i've always been interested to see when they would try him on the turf if he didn't i mean it's something they probably never would have tried if he actually did pan out on the dirt uh but i'm pretty interested in him in this race and while i get that he's probably going to get bet down and not be a great price um i'm going to give him one more chance i i'm a fan of this horse and i think this is the right surface for him so we'll see what he does here um There are some others in this race, though, that make it a pretty tough assignment. Uh, The one horse that I think is going to take a lot of money that I'm not a big fan of is the 10 value proposition. Um, He's he's the Chad Brown horse, so he's going to take plenty of money in this race. And for me, he just has to get a lot faster to beat this field. And he showed some tendencies last year that I don't like to see, especially for a Chad Brown horse. Typically, Chad Chad Brown's runners are so well-schooled that they're very professional right from the start. Uh, Value proposition in both of his victories has been very green. He shown this tendency to lug in very badly in his races uh that debut that seemed so visually impressive at the time that's come back to be a pretty weak race in retrospect and even last time when he won by a nose he was much the best that day but he almost got himself beat because of his own antics so i'm a bit uh concerned that maybe he hasn't gotten over that now even as a four-year-old so i'd use some others like arthur kitt uh, i think his return yeah. at Gulfstream was pretty good even the number 12 cross border he's in really great form right now so i wouldn't ignore him either yeah, I'm glad you mentioned Arthur Kitt. He he just he feels like a horse who's coming into this race really nicely. Like, you know, you look at his, he got the he got the nice prep out of the way last time out. He was a little slow. He was immediately in tight. He 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 I think he got a lot out of that race. He went from inside, outside, he was a little wide. And then um he he gave up a ton of ground. He and he kept trying, and then Temple was able to kind of sneak through on the rail. So it was like a winning type effort. I always like it when horses have wide trips and they get beat by a horse who sneaks through on the rail because it's almost like they can't see him. There's nothing they can really do about about that one. Arthur Kitt to me is a must use, but I think you're hundred percent right. Like it's this all comes down to how you are viewing Hidden Scroll first time on the turf. And I'm with you. This this feels like an opportunity to give him another shot. I would prefer using him than the other Chad Brown. So I think we see this race um, pretty similarly. Just kind of one overall handicapping question for you. We know that um, Jason Service and Jorge Navarro now are um, under investigation for a lot of things that have happened. People out there that are listening to us, I'm sure, know the stories. What do we do with horses now that are exiting their barns and that are going into other barns? Do you take that into account at all as maybe horses who have, I don't know, had had to deal with some something? Do you take a wait and see approach or is that not even something that comes into your mind when you're handicapping? I mean, I think you do have to be a little bit cautious because we've seen plenty of horses that have really improved for those two barns over uh, whether it's off the claim or off a trainer switch. And Hey Dakota definitely ran his best races ever for Jason Service. But I mean, I think we have to keep in mind, Hey Dakota also ran some nice races for Eddie Keneally and some prior trainers. He just wasn't quite as consistent as he got for Jason Service and didn't quite attain that level. I mean, it would be a convenient story if every horse that was in the Jason Serps and Jorge Navarro barn just couldn't run anymore after being in those stables. But that's not really what we've seen. Some no. of them come back and run just fine. Uh, so I don't want to just dismiss a horse because they were in that stable. But I do think you have to be a little bit cautious. I think you hit the, the nail on the head. You got to take it individually on a, on a horse-by-horse cases, right? You have to. I, I think some of them, if they really moved up and improved and they never showed that kind of form before, then maybe you, you kind of make a, a mental note of that. But as with a horse like Hey Dakota, when – they had ability before they just weren't quite showing it each and every race then there's still something there so i agree with you i think we have to be uh treating them on individual cases as we move to a really strong renewal of the bogey the grade three uh which is going to be the feature on belmont's opening day it's going to go as race number nine i mean you got the three inside horses that are all millionaires um you have call me love who comes in and is a multiple group stakes winner who has never finished outside of the top three you have xenobia who's a group three winner i mean this is a a really stacked short field rushing fall has been one of the better mares 
And now Philly's now a mayor when she's been uh, on her A game over the last couple of years. You've got one of the better New York breads, and oh yeah, you've got a a, a now mayor who was second in, in the Breeders' Cup Mile and has beaten the boys a few times. So just a a salty little group here. Yeah, I mean, as strong as the field is, I, I really do think it's mostly about those two horses that you finished with, Rushing Fall and God yep. Stormy. Uh, I mean, they're the two class horses in this race. They've got grade one form, and this is a grade three event. Uh, and it's going to be, it should be a match race between those two. Mm-hmm. I get the sense that most people are giving the edge to Rushing Fall. Um, and I can understand that because she's just been a win machine. I know that her 2019 campaign ended with a couple of losses, and people might give her excuses for those races. Um, but uh, I think these two are very close in terms of ability. Uh, we'll see if the mile on the 16th maybe is not ideal for one of them. I know a lot of people think God Stormy is just a pure miler. But God Stormy, when she's at her best, she's arguably better than Rushing Fall. I mean, I don't think anybody was going to beat God Stormy in that four-star Dave last year. So we'll just see if she can get back to that form. Uh, she has has been a horse that's taken a little bit while to race into form in the past. Uh, so maybe we haven't yet seen her best so far in 2020. I'm hoping they both show up because I think if they both come with their A efforts, it's going to be a real horse race. Yeah. And and so like from a pace perspective, that, that would interest me in this race. I Rushing falls probably faster than Got Stormy, but Got Stormy can use a little bit of speed if they want. So you think it's probably Rushing Fall getting out there and, and Got Stormy maybe sitting behind and trying to chase all the way around? Yeah, I've seen some people saying that that Rushing Fall is the one that's going to fall into the perfect trip in this race. I kind of feel like God Stormy is the one that's going to fall into the perfect trip because you've got Zenobia on the outside who, while she might not run, have run as fast as Rushing Fall in some prior races, she can just be a runoff, like uncontrollable type of horse. We saw and that's that got to be why you're in this India. race, right? Like if you're in this race, you got to be thinking, let's get in front of a couple of these really nice horses. Like I don't think the connections to Zenobia can think we're going to sit and maybe pass Rushing Fall or God Stormy. Try to steal it, you know? No, they're going to do what's been successful in the past, and that's just kind of letting her run off in the early going. So I think that puts rushing fall in the more difficult position because she's got to make the first move after that horse, depending on how quickly she goes up front. And I just kind of see Got Stormy sitting in the pocket, uh, sitting a perfect trip. I don't know if she's quite as good going a mile on the 16th, but if she's at her best for this race, uh, I think she's going to give rushing fall a run for her money. And uh, Got Stormy's probably the slightly better price, so I put her on top. Uh, Call Me Love I don't think is good enough to compete With the top couple in here Especially off of, of a layoff like this Where she hasn't run since November And is going to be dealing with a, a different type of pace scenario I just think there's some ability to her Maybe one to, to put a check mark next to And keep an eye on down the line When they go a little bit longer This actually might be a tad short for her She's super honest And if you watch some of her races over in Italy She just kind of is better than, than the horses that she's facing She gets to the lead and just kind of plays with them But this is not an easy spot Maybe bookmark her for somewhere down the line in um, what looks like a really strong opening day card at Belmont on Wednesday So uh, we move from Wednesday to Thursday over at Belmont And David, the first race I wanted to talk a little bit about was the fifth race um, And we, you know, we've discussed a couple of races where there have been imports uh, making Horses making their first U.S. start Well, this is going to be another one of them In race number five, we have a couple of Chad Brown Uh, We have Chad Brown Imports, one from Italy Another one um, from the UK We've got the entry of the same owners With different trainers Um, We've got a horse who just missed at the level Last time out This looks like another one of those deep Really deep allowance races That um, we're going to see a lot of Over the next couple weeks Yeah, it's kind of a wild race And I'll be interested to see how they bet this one Because Two of the horses that would have vied for favoritism, there are actually a coupled entry coming from two different trainers, uh, yeah, Clara Peters weird. We don't see that and Stone anymore. Tornado. Yeah. So, I mean, with Chad Brown and Brad Cox at an entry, I think they're going to take a lot of money. I mean, they're both legitimate contenders in their own rights. Uh, Clara Peters, she looked great in that fairgrounds uh, first start in this country, and she competed going shorter distances over in Europe. So the seven furlongs, that might work out for her. She just needs some pace ahead of her. And Stone Tornado, uh, she was kind of an all or nothing type over in Europe. She either was right there at the end or she was nowhere in a couple of races uh so it's kind of going to be interesting to see how she fits against these from a class standpoint also if the seven furlongs is the right distance for her she seems like one as well that might want to go farther in the future so i mean they're definitely a dangerous entry but there are plenty of others to consider in here um i'll be honest i haven't quite made a pick for this race yet i'm considering of the longer prices the number eight devant yeah, for uh, that's Grand where Motion. I 
There we go. Yeah, she just feels like the kind of horse where the seven furlongs is going to hit her right between the eyes. Five and a half was too short at Churchill last time. She actually ran deceptively well on that South Beach uh, at Gulfstream two back because Chris Landeros just kind of didn't really give her a shot that day, just kept mm-hmm. her way too bar- far back early. And she showed real ability over in Europe. So uh, she's one that I'm kind of looking for, maybe seven furlongs being the right distance for her. Yeah, and you know, it, when you... When you go race by race and you see the the four races that she's now run in the U.S., um, she ran into a really sharp uh, Our Baby Ruth last year who won four or five races to end 2019. And you mentioned that that race in the uh, the January 25th race at Gulfstream Park where she just didn't get a very good trip. And last time out, she was you know she was squeezed back. She lost a few lengths. She was in between. She couldn't get straightened out, and and she ends up just missing third. It's a pretty solid gallop out. She feels like a horse who's coming into this race in a you know. With with a really good opportunity to win, so I think yeah, if we can get maybe like eight to one or so or or above uh, on Devon on Devon, that should be a a nice play there. In yeah, what's just what you said? I'm very curious to see how the money is spread around in this race because when you have these horses that come in for the first time, you just don't know the way they're going to get bet. So um, an intriguing fifth race on Thursday, we get to race number eight. This is a first level allowance race for three year olds and. We have, I mean, we have a recent maiden, a recent maiden winner for Bill Mott from the rail. We have Informative, who's dropping out of a couple stakes races. Tap it to win's been really good sprinting, but now they're going to stretch back out. A famished, I mean, you you have the last four losses to Vitology, Field Pass, Independence Hall, Instructor, some really nice horses. Bosquiat won first time out and had a lot of buzz to him. Mystic Guy, I believe, was scratched out of the Matt Wynn stakes from uh, a couple weeks ago and, and pointed to uh, this spot instead. Country Grammar, I played in the Fountain of Youth, and he just had a bad start and didn't really get going until late. This is another one where, I mean, you can you can make legitimate cases for many. I just, I guess the, the, the first question I have looking into this race is, a horse like Tap It to Win, with such success sprinting, and you stretch back out, do you think that he... You think that it's kind of an anomaly and that he could be okay going a trip like this? Yeah, he's a fascinating horse. I mean, going back to the Breeders' Futurity last year, I was so confident that he was going to win that race. Uh, He was only 7-2. Yeah. Yeah. I really thought he was going to turn out to be one of the best two-year-olds of last year off that maiden victory at, at Saratoga. Because remember, that was Travers Day when there was that notorious dead rail. And he was the only horse to overcome that that dead rail bias because he rode the rail the entire way and was dominant winning that race. So that race is arguably better than the speed figure indicates. I don't know what happened at the end of last year. I mean, it's easy to say that it was the stretch out and distance, but he didn't even show his customary speed in those races. Yeah. Uh, he was just, something went wrong at the end of last year, but he looked good in his return at Gulfstream Park. He certainly bred to go two turns, or this is a one-turn race, but a mile and a 16th around one turn. That's certainly supposed to be in his wheelhouse from a pedigree standpoint. It just remains to be seen if he can do it on the racetrack. Uh, so he's very intriguing to me, but he's also really hard to trust. Yeah, and... In- you know, if you see a don't if you just see the Florida bread race last time out, go look at that race. It was stronger than like a normal first level allowance Florida bread race. It was actually a pretty salty little group. So it's not like a company thing with him. I think it's just which which tap it to win are we gonna see? And I completely agree with you. I picked him on one of my fantasy teams after that maiden special weight. I thought he was gonna be very, very legitimate. And he just something went amiss, but he came back at the start of twenty twenty and he looked very, very good. Let's uh, let's get to Bosquiot, who will take a ton of money, I'm sure, in here for Chad Brown. He won. It was was pretty impressive. The I guess the knock that some people will have is the runner up Osh I am came back last weekend and was fourth as the favorite next out at Churchill Downs. But the fourth place finisher from that race did win a maiden special weight next out. The sixth place finisher did win for maiden thirty five. I mean he just sat a couple lengths off, three off. He was in the clear. Maybe about fourth or fifth. He angled around. He moved to the lead. He geared down. He just he was treated like the best horse in that race. Um, where do you stand with Bosquiat? I mean, he looked really good first time out, and he's another one that seems like he's got the physical makeup to go this distance. He seems like a pretty big, imposing kind of horse, um, and he did everything right in his debut. Um, it's funny to, to downgrade the performance based on Ashiyam coming back right. and losing as the favorite. <laughs> right. um, I mean, it, that makes sense on the surface of things, and sometimes, you know, you don't always go back and see, well, which race did he run in next time? And I was just looking at the charts in uh, Timeform US, and uh, Ashiyam actually improved his speed figure by nine points mm-hmm. running fourth in that point. race at Churchill last week, so... There's an argument that he actually flattered the race, not uh, the opposite. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what we get from Bosquiat on the stretch out. But again, with Chad Brown in his corner, he's going to take plenty of money. 
and I thought, you know, Mystic Guide, the the type of improvement that you'd like to see from a horse when they stretch out to a mile and a sixteenth. He settled fifth. He was a couple lengths off. He was in that third flight, and then he made a big five wide bid at the top of the lane. We've already seen the third place finisher Verb win a maiden special weight next out. The fourth place finisher Reprobate uh, went over onto the grass and won a maiden special weight long on the grass. And even the ninth place finisher dropped in and won a, a maiden twenty. So he's defeated a group that's come back to run pretty well so far. I don't really have a whole lot of knocks on on you know what he did from start one to start two. Yeah, I like this horse. I'm a fan. I thought his debut was really encouraging. And then last time, I mean, uh, Brian Hernandez just rode him like he was the best horse. I mean, he was wide the entire way and and just took that race over very easily and, and won seemingly with something left. Uh, I think he's got a lot of talent. I know they entered in the mat win and decided to go to this somewhat easier spot instead. Uh, I just like the way they're bringing him along. And I was a big fan of his damn music note. I mean, she's one of these horses that it's easy to forget about because she never really got to shine in the Breeders' Cup as she was racing during during the synthetic era of the Breeders' Cup, but during the main body of the year, like 20, 2009, 2010, she put forth some really amazing efforts, and uh, if he can live up to that kind of pedigree, he's going to be a nice horse. And then we'll quick mention the, the couple outside horses. I guess on paper, there's not a ton of sprint speed that you would think has to get the lead. It's probably going to be nothing better, um, I guess, taking the field as far as he can. He was a debut winner at Parks. Who knows You know if he can get... The lead and, and you know how far he can take a group That's much better like this and then country grammar Towards the outside who he just didn't really have A shot after his slow start he's kind Of an intriguing horse though the fact that they uh, They tossed him into the fountain of youth off that um, Off that maiden breaking score And so with the outside Two any positives any negatives yeah, nothing better. I don't really know what to make of him because he's coming out of uh, just a weaker maiden race, and I think this is going to be a real class test and also a speed figure test for him because he hasn't run quite as fast as some others. And Country Grammar, I kind of have taken the negative view on him. I was way against him in the Fountain of Youth. Just as somebody who follows the New York circuit very closely, I thought that his maiden victory at Aqueduct was pretty dressed up. Um, that was a very slow pace. It was a day where horses just could not close from the back of the pack, and I thought he really took advantage of a very favorable trip that day. So for for me, I just kind of need to see some more from him, but he's obviously not impossible in here. So this might be a race where you're kind of building around Mystic Guide? Yeah, Mystic Guide, and then the little tap it to win in Basquiat, but uh, I, I think one of the three favorites is going to is going to win this race. And we get to race number nine, which is the Tiller Stakes, mile and three eighths on the Widener Turf course. Again, we talk about some of these small stakes races that end up um, really, really live. I mean, you have... Uh, Standard deviation here who's multiple Grade one placed you have some horses Who we've seen for a while in Some of these really really good Distance turf like the, some of the Top turf distance routers Sadler's Joy Channel maker from the last few years um, So this is again A, a group that comes up pretty strong For uh, an $80,000 stakes race Where do you start in the field like This I mean, I guess you have to consider Sadler's Joy the horse to beat because he's just so consistent and he doesn't always win these races. He actually doesn't win very often, but it seems like he's always around at the end and they've just run him in so many grade one races. This is really a step down in class for him. Um, we saw what he can do when he gets some class relief in the Redsmith last year when he just dominated a similar kind of group. Um his first two performances of 2020, I guess you could say they were a little, dis a little disappointing, but he really had no shot given his trip in the Pegasus. Mm -hmm. That was just a disaster. And last time out, um, I thought a couple of horses got the jump on him, and maybe Javier Castellano didn't time Sadler's Joy's move correctly because he sort of rode him into traffic. He had to stop and start again. He was never going to win that race, but I thought maybe he could have been a little bit closer. So I'm not willing to write him off by any means and say that he's some kind of vulnerable favorite. I think he's the most likely winner. It's fair to have more questions about his main rival, Channel Maker, because they come out of a lot of similar races. And Channel Maker, it just seems like he's really hard to predict these days. He's hard to ride. He just doesn't have his mind on running sometimes. So while he's also got those same classy form lines, he's a little bit harder to trust. Is some of the uh, longer horse, uh, priced horses, a couple that I want to ask uh, your opinion on. I thought this might be a decent race or a decent spot for Dot Matrix, who... I think if you just kind of put a line through that last effort, completely missed the break, had absolutely no shot. And if you look at the field that he was facing in, in that grade two, 
it was actually a pretty strong group. The third place finisher, Rock Emperor, came back, was only beaten a nose in the Whittingham. The fourth place finisher, Aquaphobia, was second next out in the stakes at Gulfstream behind a sharp horse named Holiday. The fifth place finisher is Synchrony. I mean, we, we know him as a six time graded stakes winner. Instilled Regard was in there, uh, and Channel Maker was also in that race. So, Dot Maker, I think, is coming out of a, a pretty strong group. He wasn't beaten a whole heck of a lot by Sadler's Joy last year. He kind of he has a little bit more of a, a tactical advantage on some of these because He's not going to be as far back Obviously he missed the break last time out He can sit a little closer But is he good enough to beat some of the best in here? Yeah, it's one of those races where once you get past Sadler's Joy, a lot of these horses look very similar. It's and very for true. me, yes. Dot Matrix is one of them. I mean, he's got a few races that definitely put him in the mix. Like you said, the Connolly and even the Red Smith. It was a solid effort, even though Sadler's Joy was just superior to him. And uh, yeah, he had no chance last time. So he's probably going to be a bigger price than he really should in this race because of that non-effort in the in the Muniz. Uh, and maybe he's just a better horse going a distance like a mile and three eighths. Uh, that could be a possibility with him. Uh, so he's a horse that I could see you using in here uh for me, uh, the horse that I think is most interesting to possibly upset Sadler's Joy is uh, one of the more obvious horses, the one standard deviation. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really liked his race in Saudi Arabia, in, uh, what was it, Qatar last Qatar. time? Yeah. 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 Uh, that, that Amir trophy. Uh, French King has won that race two years in a row, and he just kind of got to walk along in the lead and sprint for home. And standard deviation made a really nice run from the back of the pack that day and uh, kind of signaled to me that maybe longer distances are really what this horse wants. Uh, uh, and he's a three-year-old who's now just turned four, so he's got room for improvement. So I think he's the real danger. Yeah, you know, he. I, I've always liked this horse from his from his debut, and then the good the good third in the Breeders' Futurity. That was one of those races where you kind of like signal, oh, maybe this is going to be a late running three-year-old next year, you know. And, and that wasn't that didn't end up going to, to plan for standard deviation, but he just hasn't done a whole hell of a lot wrong in his life. You know, he generally shows up and gives you a pretty good account of himself, and he could be continuing to improve. One more bust out long shot. I just wanted to ask about in this field. Uh, Hayabusa one is a horse who. I would love to see if that March 15th race was at the beginning of May. I think I would feel a little bit different about trying to get him into the exotics. I don't like the fact that he didn't have a race from April of 2018 to March of 2020. And now it's been, again, you know, a couple months since he's going to race. But he has a couple races when he was chasing It's in the Post on the West Coast. And that was when It's in, when it's in the Post was really good. I think his top top level could at least sneak into some of the exotics here. Yeah, he's another difficult horse to assess. Um, he's one that's easy to forget about because those races against Dits in the Post were, I mean, they were over two years ago yeah. at this point. Uh, and he obviously had that long layoff to deal with last time. I mean, he was six out of seven runners in that Gulfstream race, so that was disappointing. Uh, but that also may have been just too short for him. And if you watch that race, uh, Noble Lindy just walked along on the front end, got to sprint for home. Uh, nobody was really making up big uh, moves from the back of the pack. And he got into gear, but just got into gear way too late. So... I guess you can say that maybe he'll improve off of that. You just don't know where he's going to go after that long break. Hayabusa one who is a big price there. But David, I think one thing that we can both agree on, um, really good racing the, the first couple of days of, uh, of the meet over at Belmont. The, the Wednesday opening day card, really strong. Uh, the Thursday card, it's just a lot interesting. We're seeing lots of these horses show up that we haven't seen in a while um, because there hasn't been racing going on. So just lots, lots of like good underlying storylines in these races to sink our teeth into. Um, I'd imagine you're, you're probably pretty pumped uh, over there making the, the lines for these first couple days because it's, it's been a while. I've seen you've been focusing in on, on some of the good racing elsewhere, but it's always nice when they come back home for you. Yeah, it's been a long time coming, and ever since they drew these first couple of cards, I just can't wait for Wednesday, and it's been tough. Uh, these are not easy races to do, to get a sense of. Well, the uh, morning lines, it, i got to imagine, right? Especially when you have a lot of these horses who haven't run in a while, coming from, and we've seen, like you said, a lot of the imports. You don't know how they're going to get bet, so it. I think I get the gist, though, for someone like you. You, you enjoy the challenge, I think. Oh, for sure. And I, I felt a little rusty at first because uh, I wasn't thinking about races in that way for yeah. a couple months now, uh, because doing it as a handicapper is a different kind of exercise. Uh, but uh, no, it's the kind of work that I love. So it's just great to get back to it. David Aragona, you can follow him on Twitter at Horse to Watch. You can listen to the Timeform US Pacecast. It's still a couple every week, right? You do a recap one and then another one that's kind of like a preview. 
Yeah, as we get back into racing, I think we're going to prioritize the handicapping show later in the week, but uh, we'll announce what our schedule is every week. Awesome. It's a, if you're a, a handicapper, a gambler, or just a horse racing fan, make sure to go subscribe to that. That should be part of your weekly, um, you know, your, your handicapping and part of your weekly horse racing analysis as you recap the past week and then move forward to the next one. David, thank you so much, buddy. We'll, we'll be uh, following along with you through, uh, through all of New York. Keep, uh, keep doing a great job over there, and thank you for joining us. Sounds good. Great to be back on. That is David Aragona there from New York, the morning line maker for the NYRA. We're going to take a quick break here on That's What G Said. Don't go anywhere, though, folks. We will be right back. And a big thank you to David for helping us out there, going through some of the big races for Belmont Park. Opening back up on Wednesday and Thursday, I just wanted to quickly recap some of my selections um, throughout the, uh, the Wednesday and Thursday races. So Wednesday in the third race, the, I think it's all about Fauci, I really do But if you are playing any Maltese And you are looking for another one Give the Five Indoctrinate a little bit of a look in there The uh, the first timer For Cassie In race number 6, I do like the 4 The new face, Say Hey um, Just to mention A few things about Say Hey He had a sneaky good last out race He was kind of mid-back, he was in a ton of traffic He never got a shot to really stretch the. She never got a shot to, to really stretch her legs and Joel takes the call for Clement. We know this barn is capable with new shooters. We know this barn is capable off the bench. This filly's been training on the turf, um, and she should be ready to rock. She's won her debut, uh, won her debut, so I know she can fire fresh. She's interesting in a race that is a very contentious race. Don't forget about Bariqua. Um, hey, if you're looking for a bust out long shot, the two maybe in, in underneath spots excess capacity. Maybe the one to catch first time on the turf, a major pace factor. In a race that doesn't really scream having a lot of speed on paper. In that eighth race, it's the turf debut of Hidden Scroll. For me, um, I will include Hidden Scroll in a lot of the exotics, but the horse I'll probably end up betting is the five Arthur Kit, who was a step slow, then got into you know into some trouble, was in tight, made a wide move um, into the turn, and then got tucked in, was in between horses. Made a really nice three, four wide sustained bid at the top of the lane. Gave up a ton of ground and was a strong second that day behind Temple, who moves through along the inside. Don't forget about Arthur Kitt in race number eight. That that's the number five, and then in race number nine, the uh, the Bogey. I di- I didn't really know what to do in that race, honestly, from a, a wagering perspective. I did think that it really d- does come down to. Um, you know, rushing fall got stormy, and then if you're looking for a wild card, to me that would be call me love. I just feel like she's going to be a little bit better going longer. I'd love to have seen her with already one race under her belt, but she does have some ability. Go back and watch those races in Italy. You can find them on YouTube. She's a multiple group stakes winner. She she she's never run a bad race. Good opening day card on Wednesday, and then on Thursday, a uh, couple to mention the you know. Fifth race is the one where I'm probably going to make a, a nice play on the eight, Devont, who's going to make the four start in the U.S. Um, talked about the horse that they ran into, the sharp, our baby, Ruth. Um, went to the bench from January 25th to May 20th, and then last time out was in tight, shuffled, squeezed back, lost a few lengths, was in eighth, ninth, was eight off, was last at the top of the lane, moved inside in between horses, but couldn't really get straightened out and just missed third. They were really solid gallop out. That's the number eight, Devont. In race, and that's in race number five, so uh, definitely one to, uh, to to take a look at, which is an interesting race with all those imports, and then you have the uh, the entry. In race number eight, the first level allowance, I do think that Chappett's win, totally respect. I just... I don't know about going a little longer. I'm just not sure. If this race was going six, six and a half, seven, I would love to have it to win. I'm just a little worried that he may not be his best going longer. But as David mentioned, I think they, the races were too bad to just say, yeah, he didn't want to go that long. The Basquiat, the number five, very, very logical. But to me, the six missed a guide. I'm with David on this one. He's been so impressive. He has been so visually good. He scratched out of the mat win in his, his start. He made a five wide bid at the top of the lane. We've seen a couple of next out winners come out of that race. Um, 
I like Country Grammar a little bit too. I love the Maiden Special Weight win more than um, than David did. He beat a couple next out winners that day in the Fountain of Youth. He had a slow start. He was squeezed out of a spot. He ended up, you know, last early chasing lone speed of Ete Indian. I thought he closed pretty well to not be far out of second. I'm not quite ready to give up on Country Grammar yet, but for me, it's Mystic Guide in the uh, the eighth race is maybe a a single or maybe a, a key in uh, some of the late exotics. And then in the the ninth race, which is the feature, Dot Matrix for a three winner two back should be sitting a little closer. Totally respect standard deviation. I'm okay with playing against some of the older in here. Saddler's Joy, Channel Maker, whose best will would would win this. I'm fine with taking a horse like Standard Deviation with some upside, and and I'm going to put de- Dot Matrix on top of Standard Deviation, who. You know, slow start chasing lone speed in a loaded field. It completely missed the break, and it almost looked like he was held up by the assistant starter. It was a race where the winner won wire to wire. The third place finisher has come back to win uh, to finish, beating just a nose in a grade two. The fourth place finisher was second in the stakes at Gulfstream Park, and the fifth place finisher was Synchrony. The sixth place finisher was in still regard. It was a good group. Hayabusa one is the other price horse I would include in some of your exotics. Chased lone speed Did make up some ground late Was not that far out of it It was the first start since April of 2018 Needed the race Tossed Really tossed the result of the race But know that you got a lot out of it And His best efforts Absolutely compete with these Hayabusa won So those are some of the, the thoughts for Thursday Over at Belmont Park uh, A big thank you again to David For coming on and helping us chat Some Belmont Thursday Right now, we're going to hear from one of our sponsors, and then we're going to talk with Sean Alvarez about some Churchill Downs Thursday. So get your Churchill Downs Thursday, June the 4th, past performances out. We go through races 4 um, through 9. We begin in that 4th race, which is a race filled with first-time starters. Get those past performances out for June the 4th. We're going to talk Churchill Downs Thursday with Sean Alvarez coming up next. One of the sponsors of That's What G Said podcast is Cindy Carava, full service realtor. And I am here over in Glendora at Coldwell Banker with Cindy Carava. Cindy, how was 2019 for you? Tell us uh, a little bit about what uh, what kind of stuff you were working on. Hi, Gino. Thanks for having me. Uh, 2019 was just really great. Uh, I had a great year uh, selling homes all the way from Altadena, Arcadia, Monrovia, out to Upland and Ontario just recently. Um, the market has, has been uh, really good. Um, we're looking forward to 2020 with an increase in home prices about 5.8% this year, opposed to last year where it was a little softer. We saw uh, more like homes averaging about 3.5% in increase in value. Um, it's also looking great for buyers. Uh, the interest rates right now are going to be staying under 4%. So if you've been on the fence about thinking about buying a home, home, now is the time to do so with interest rates still staying low. And you offer more services than just the buying, selling, and leasing homes. Tell us about some of the other services that you offer and what a full service realtor really is. So you're right, Gino. Besides me being uh, a full-service realtor of uh, finding properties for my clients to buy or selling their homes or finding rentals for them, um, I also have a plethora of resources like uh, handyman, contractors, electricians, plumbers. Uh, I even, if like I said, if you're thinking about getting a home loan, I actually work with two great lenders that I can recommend to anybody. And you're all over the internet, social media, websites. Let us know some of the places where we can find you. I know I've seen some reviews on Yelp and on Zillow. They, everyone always has positive things to say. Everybody hears me raving about you all the time. But where can uh, everyone else find out information about you or contact? Thank you, Gino. Yeah, I am on Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn. Um, and uh, you can contact me on my website, which is www.cindycarava.com. Or my email, which is cindyc.realtor at gmail.com. Or feel free to call or text me on my cell phone, which is 626-394-6400. Cindy is awesome. She's one of the kindest and most genuine people I've ever met. I promise you, you will enjoy every minute you interact with her. So thank you very much, Cindy. Uh, Appreciate all of your support from That's What She Said podcast. Thank you, Gino. Have a great day, everyone. Racing is back up into 
pretty much full swing. I know we have uh, racing back at a lot of the major circuits now, and um, I'm very happy to be bringing in folks to uh, help me break down some of the the racing from different cards. And this next gentleman, super excited to talk to Sean, someone who I've interacted with many times on social media over the last few years or so, but I don't think ever really sat down and had a conversation like this where we were able to kind of introduce each other, introduce ourselves and, and break down a racing card. And right now, folks, I wanted to really mention this guy is one of the nicest, most respectful people you'll find on social media as far as horse racing, Twitter is concerned, someone who's super positive, really fun to interact with, not someone that's going to like be really negative and dragging you down in like a really unfortunately negative time in the world. So a great person to follow, someone who is a really sharp handicapper now. And what I love about you, Sean, uh, we welcome in Sean Alvarez is you seem like someone who is always like adding to your repertoire when I follow you. You seem like you're always listening, you're watching shows, you're watching videos, you're listening to other people who may have a little more experience, and you're trying to always add, you're trying to always get better. I respect that quite a bit as a horse player, man. Welcome to That's What G Said. Thanks for joining us. Hey, Gino, I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, you know, and kind of going back to what you were saying about just being kind on Twitter, I've been fortunate enough to meet uh, a lot of different people in the game that have been successful, and they've been even friendlier than I would have even imagined they could have been in helping me with my handicapping along the way. So truthfully, that's not only what I tried to, you know, push on Twitter, you know, as far as just kind of congratulating people and, and being nice and, and, and kind of creating that horse player community. Um, But also, you know, that's where I get my handicapping, you know, knowledge from as well. You know, you're talking about being, you know, being a sponge and, and, and picking up different handicapping styles. You know, I, I, I can't, really take any credit for that that's really just you know you know the friendly people either on twitter or people i meet at the track just helping me out yeah and and you know what there is a ton of information out there nowadays which means there's something that's going to be bad but there's a ton of good information like really good podcasts really good videos really smart people who are putting stuff out there and i love to listen to as many as i can because you know what you're Maybe some days you're not going to be like blindly playing the pick five of someone that you heard, but it might be like an angle that you pick up that you end up using a month down the line or just something to kind of put in the back in your back pocket or in the back of your head. I feel just what you said. The word sponge is great because it's not necessarily that I'm going to blindly listen and whatever Sean said on Saturday, I'm going to follow, but there might be one horse in one of those races where I'm spreading that I didn't use where I'm going, Hey, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to use that one. And that might be the one horse that helps you get a big, a big score. So it's just kind of absorbing the information and trying to weed through it and figure out what you need, what's going to be good for you, because there's a hell of a lot of good stuff out there, man. We're in a really good age for horse racing. Yeah. You know, there is a lot of good stuff out there. And, you know, like you said, there's, there's some bad information out there, but there's also a lot of good information. There's also just some information you might gravitate towards because that's their, your handicapping style kind of matches their handicapping yeah, style. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, if, if you're on the fence about singling an eight to one that you really like, what's even better than somebody's, you know, opinion that you respect saying, I love this horse. And, you know, singling a six to five, that's great when, you know, you think it's a free square or whatnot. Um, but when you single that eight to one, when other people are spreading, that's where you're really kind of cashing the tickets. And when I'm, when I'm looking at different shows, that's kind of what I'm looking for is, is to find those opinion, opinions that match up with mine and also match up with my handicapping style. So let's talk about the the last few years for you, Sean. Like, give us a little bit of a, a background on you. What what have, has your life been like? Where are you from growing up? And then, like, how'd you get into horse racing and, and gambling? Well, uh, so sports has always been my life. I've loved pretty much every sport there is. I didn't know about horse racing at all. Um, grew up playing baseball throughout, you know, high school and travel ball in college. And it came to a point where I just wasn't good enough. My body, you know, I'm five, nine, 180 pounds soaking wet with the towel on. So, you know, that's at some point you just kind of, kind of hang up the, you know, the cleats in the glove. Um, and I was working at Fairbanks Ranch Country Club, which is a mile, about a mile east of Del Mar racetrack. And it was 2012 and I was teaching golf and I was, I was a low man on the totem pole. So I got all the, all the kid lessons and I walk in and there's a note on my drawer in my head pro's handwriting that said, call Jill Baffert. She wants lessons for her son. Oh, wow. And not knowing horse racing. I, I immediately went, well, who's that? I know they're not members. Um, so I, I have no clue, but it's in my head pro's handwriting. So I should probably call him. So make a long story short, uh, I called them. They wanted lessons for Bodie. I gave lessons uh, three days a week during the Del Mar uh, season. And the whole year, Jill kept saying, if you want to go to the track, just let me know. 
and I didn't know anything about horse racing. So I'm, I just, I was just happy getting, you know, getting, uh, getting lessons and, you know, Jill was Jill and Bob and everybody involved were super nice. So I, I, I was happy and fast forward a full year, they came back and one of my coworkers got win and said, you need to go to the track. If you don't even <laughs> want to you'll Especially enjoy with them. Now. Like you need to go with them. <laughs> yes, for sure. Yeah. So, uh, first day I said, you know, Jill, I'll take you up on that. And she, le- she leaves, um, tickets for me. And so I go in and my thing is, I don't, I, I get it, you know, losing in sports, comp- you know, competition, losing happens, but I don't like to lose. So the first three or four times I never even went and saw them. I just went by myself because I figured if I, if I don't like losing a $5 bet, this is their livelihood. Yeah. Um, and so all the way again, fast forward until the Pacific classic, Jill finally catches wind that I've been going to the track and says, We've got a horse running in the Pacific Classic. We think he's got a good chance to win. You should be our guest. So they um, invited me to join them for the Pacific Classic. And I thought the coolest thing was being behind their box and seeing Joe Torrey below me, being an owner of Game on Duke. So forget the horse racing. Joe Torrey's sitting in front of me. And I'm not even a Yankee fan. I'm just a baseball fan. So um, as Game on Duke opened up by about, I don't know, 15 lengths, I said, you know, kind of teach me everything you know. And uh, I kept going to the track and, you know, pounding my head against the wall, losing bets left and right and trying to learn and, um, you know, develop strategies here and there. But um, yeah, fast forward many years up until 2018, I was at Del Mar again, just, you know, trying to hit a pick five, trying to hit a pick four, trying to figure a few things out. And um, I got a text message from uh, Jeff Chapman up at uh, Chappie up at Santa Anita. Nice. Chappie. And uh, he was at the veranda and he says, oh, you're at Del Mar. Come see me at the veranda. So I walk over there and who's he with? But Jonathan Kinchin, James Henry, Jose Arias and Duke Matisse. Nice. So I'm like, well, I know the all these group. guys. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know him personally. But um, so I, I truthfully, I wanted to get out of there. I don't want to bug them. They were there for a contest. I just, you know, I don't want to get in the way. And um, each and every one of them got up and out of their seats, came over and shook my hand, introduced And not only were friendly with me, but, you know, they would make a play. And as they're going to the gate, they would say, you know, I'm on the three or I'm on the nine. And so not only was it nice to be involved with their contest, when James Henry's on the nine and he can tell halfway through the race, he has no chance and Duke's on the three, he's suddenly screaming for the three. James isn't involved with Duke at all on his play, but he just wants his friend to you know, yeah. to do well. That's cool. And that, I, from that, from that moment, I'm like, I, I, I want to get in contest. Um, so from, from there, uh, I was lucky enough to have a phone call with Jonathan Kinchin and what I thought was going to be a 15 minute phone call turned out to be about three hours of just kind of laying out contest strategies, contests to play in kind of how the NHT NHC works. Um, I mean, a wealth of knowledge. So like I said, I've, I've been very lucky with just, happen to be fortunate enough to meet some very not only nice but successful people in the horse racing world yeah that, i mean that's what it comes down to right it's like you get you have a good experience once or twice it's like if you would have had a bad experience you probably wouldn't have maybe not come back or but some, but you've got good feelings from the people who helped you out and that's what has kind of kept you coming and man i've been seeing your name uh pop up in the last year year and a half in particular on these on, on the tournaments i know uh you've been doing really really well with those so i just love following along and seeing the progress that you've made because um it's uh it, it's awesome for for uh for me to watch to see how like how you keep picking things up and how much you're better from 2 years ago from 3 years ago till right now and um i, I was really looking forward to uh, to talking about it with you so before we get into specifics about this Churchill card when you're handicapping the races and sit down like what are some of the things you're doing what are some of the things that are important to you to look at so i've always started and this this kind of came from who you know a member at fairbanks that is a pretty successful horse player kind of taught me how to read the racing form and kind of project the race i'm a very visual learner on this i was the same way with golf don't tell me what to do kind of put me in that position and i'll replicate it and i'm the same way in horse racing i like to kind of visualize in my mind the pace of the race so that's where I start. I go from top to bottom. I yep. don't worry about odds. I don't worry about, I'll look at jockeys because I think jockeys have a lot to, to do with, you know, moving a horse up or even pulling that horse back. Um, but I'm just, I'm just trying to picture the pace of the race. And when I do that, I feel like I've, I've kind of started with a real good base. 
I agree. I think that's that's the the best starting point and and probably the the easiest starting point to tell someone, okay, is how do you think this race is going to shape up on paper? Kind of picture it out in your head. Who or which horses are going to be towards the front Which horses are going to be towards the middle Who's going to be towards the back And and then you can visually see Okay, there are going to be a ton of horses up towards the front now We probably want to pick a horse that's maybe going to be coming from the back Towards the middle And obviously then we start getting into more of the specifics So yeah, for me, like I'm a super big trip handicapper So I'm I'm watching, you know like every replay that's relevant Anything that I can find that seems good Because that, that, that to me gives me a better opportunity to get a feel for each horse And so we're going to jump into now uh, Churchill Downs for Thursday everyone So get your past performances out We are looking at Thursday June the 4th at Churchill Downs And we're going to play uh, We're going to go to race number 4 And we're going to talk you through the last you know six races on the card Those are the better races at Churchill That's how they've been stacking them so far At least in the last uh, few weeks and, and we get to start with a race that This is definitely one of I guess my weaknesses as a handicapper Because what I just said I, th- I think my strength as a handicapper Is analyzing the trips of horses Watching their replay getting able, to, Being able to maybe find something That I like that was maybe you know Trouble or something that other people won't find But in this type of a race, Sean We literally don't have any races to watch This is an entire field of first time starters These are maidens, fillies, two year olds They're going to go five and a half furlongs on the turf course So in this kind of a field We're basically... Looking, I mean, we can watch now with XBTV some of these first time starter workouts. I don't know about any in this particular field, some from Santa Anita, some from Gulfstream. But if you're looking at a race where you can't watch the re uh, watch the replays, watch the workouts, some of the things we're, I guess, having to do in this race is pedigree, trainer info, you know, sire dam info, I guess, all of that first time starter type stuff. Yeah, I, I mean, like you said, it's, it's it's a literal blank canvas right now, and it's kind of up to you to kind of draw it out. Um, so for me, with me, I, you know, I'm, I kind of lean towards the contest play when I'm handicapping a card. Um, so for me, I'm looking for value. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, Always. the six, the Mark Cassie uh, Road to Romance is going to be tough to beat. Uh, bread to handle the turf. has got bullet works in there from the gate. Uh, Mark Cassie can fire first time out. Um and if the 12 draws in the first timer from Wesley Ward, I mean, any first timer from Wesley Ward going, going on the turf, especially on a track like Tertiary Downs needs to be, you know, you need, you got to watch out for that. But for me, I kind of start with, well, let's go with the body of the field. And as the favorite drawn in the absolute middle in a turf sprint, like I just, I, I, I want to beat that horse in yeah. my opinion. So I go, I go straight to turf pedigree at that point. Um, for me, I'm looking at the turf numbers on the DRF formulator on the right uh, in the parentheses. But I also I love to just kind of go through the dams pedigree, um, especially on turf uh, horses. I feel like the dams pedigree holds a little bit stronger. I so agree. Yep. for me, with the three, um, the three doesn't have a lot of pedigree. The warfront should be able to handle it. Uh, and I looked back at the past performances, and while the uh, while we don't have a lot to go with with the siblings PPs, the uh, the dam actually was successful and ran decent races. Didn't win on the turf, but proved they can handle it. So for me, I mean, at starting at six to one, and I think that price is going to go up, especially if the Wesley Ward horse draws in. For me, that you know that's value. And then you know, shorter to the first turn, five and a half for a long sprint. We only got to go one turn, so I find a little bit of value with the three. Yeah, I agree. Um, you have a barn who is very capable with first time starters. You know, you see a number uh, in your past performances if you're looking at the DRF where you see an eight percent. This is the barn who, though, when you expand that, they're you know they have fifteen for their last one, sixty when you go back five years. They're five for eighty two with two year old first time starters. Five for sixty nine with first timers on the turf. Three for thirty five with two year old firsters on the turf. So we're talking about super capable, not like one. And this might be one of those spots where I think the three is very, very, very live in here. Um, you mentioned Road to Romance, another one that I, I always kind of a barn that I gravitate towards a lot, in particular in the two year old races, like in the early part of the year, is John Hancock, who we've actually already seen win with a two year old first timer this year named Hopeful Princess. Um, the dam of this one was a four-time winner of Ever Clever, uh, Ever Clever Lady, who I'm talking about now, the number eight. This one's dam was a stakes winner and actually won her debut at two by seven lengths at Tampa. You have some works over at Riverside Downs. The dam only tried turf once and was fourth in a tough allowance race. And the sire 
Vancouver was a turf monster This is the first full So this is one that kind of what you're talking about There's enough turf in there And there's some success with a barn that's good first time out And I think a little sneaky with the horse That's coming in from Riverside down So I think uh, Ever Clever Lady Might be another one to uh, include on your tickets If you know, Depending on how you're playing um, Any other horses in here that uh, that strike your fancy Or that you want to mention? Uh, yeah, the other the other one I kind of thought about was the nine some nights. Yes. Um, like I said, turf pedigree. We've got the bull at work, but also the bullet worker was on a good track, right? So it had a little bit of moisture in the ground, and uh, there's a fifty percent chance of rain at the, at the time. So while it might not be a heavy rain, we might get some kind of later in the card. So that might be something to think about. Keep in mind we're talking on a Monday night. You know, we're talking about a Thursday. Yeah, a card. couple days early. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. And another thing to compliment some nights This is a barn that a lot of people Probably see the name and they don't necessarily Know as like a big a big name Barn but they were 4 for 14 With their first time starters in the last Five years on, on the DRF Equibase They actually ran second with the first time starter Against Maiden Special Weights at Laurel earlier in March So another barn where they may not get the kind of stock that Wesley Ward has Or the kind of horses first time out to win as much But when I think Hancock or McCutcheon One of them has a first time starter I think they can absolutely Brian Lynch who you mentioned earlier They can absolutely handle the horse And get them ready to win first time out And I think the same with the with the horse drawn to the outside Depending on who draws in And that's mid-year Whose dam was a three-time winner All the wins came sprinting on the dirt um, This There are nine foals that she's produced Seven of them are winners A couple of them won it too Including a horse named Yearly Report Who was a six-time winner Who earned 835000 Won the debut Won it too Was a multiple graded stakes winner Not necessarily as much turf there But a lot of good precocity for mid-year So yeah, I think we're both on the same page here If you're playing you know, uh, I don't know if you're playing a pick six, if you're playing the early pick five at Churchill, if you're playing some kind of rolling exotics and stuff. I think, especially in a first time starter full field like this, I'm completely fine with taking chances against Road to Romance with, you know, combinations of maybe the four horses or different horses that we mentioned um, and, and maybe another one or two. Yeah, and I think it's a great race to play as, uh, vertically. I'm not yep. a, much of a vertical player, but I mean, if, especially if the 12 draws in. Both of the the six and the twelve are going to take money, and if you beat that horse, even in the just the first place position, um, you know the, we're going to look at some decent payouts. That's race number four at Churchill Downs, a fun little maiden special weight uh, on Thursday. We move to race number five, and this is a group of sixteen claimers. So if you're a, a pick five player and you play the late pick five, this fifth race will start that late pick five sequence. And um, I think for me at least, kind of. Starting in this race and, and looking There are a couple horses that I don't think have to win That are probably going to take a, a good amount of money in here Same kind of approach we were talking in the last race And one of them is probably the horse that kicks off the field And that's Cowboy Karma For Steve Asmussen Who they claimed for 20 Took a shot against a little tougher against 25 They were off slow, didn't show a whole lot But this is a horse who who does that Kind of a lot Sean he's a little bit Slow he draws the rail I don't know if that's necessarily a positive He may need things to kind of come To him I might like him a little better Maybe going at six and a half or seven than six From the rail what do you do with cowboy karma Here I mean exactly like You said I mean if you give me a horse that Has proven that we're going to break Slow you, you throw the rail in At one turn I mean I, I immediately just take that horse Take that horse out as far as trying to uh, I'm going to try to beat that horse. Yep. Um, I actually stuck with I looked I, I was kind of on the fence um, between the four and the eight. Actually, uh, I think the four has a lot of back class to go to has proven uh, to run um, decently off the layoff. Not great, but proven to be there and it has back class to go to. Um, and I really like the eight. I don't know how you handicap but my DRF uh, uh, past performances have the time form. Uh, ratings US. and speed ratings yep. in there yeah so and when i see a horse that's running with red figures over and over and over again and now i get to uh, you know we're drawn to the outside we can be a little bit more tactical um and, and then you give me 12 to 1 uh, that, so again like you said we have short price horses that i don't think need to win and then you want to give me a, an, a horse that that's eight to one that i don't think is going to have to run into those type of fractions I'm glad you mentioned those two in particular uh, the, the the ladies weekend the eight Who yeah I mean she, he's honest Like he's really honest it's, and, and he's done some really good work in his You know towards the end of, of 2019 And into the beginning of 2020 He's actually run 
a good race or two here at Churchill. We see the win back on November the 17th, so it's not like he's just a, a synthetic horse that you saw coming from, from Turfway either. You, you mentioned the opportunity to sit or to show a little speed, and when you're drawn to the outside, you have that option. And the four who... I think I'm going to have on all of my exotics too That's Spike Shrill Because this is a horse who has a lot of back class And they were just kind of off of that, that long layoff Hadn't raced from November of 2018 to January of 2020 Trying to figure out where she fit Coming back off the bench And she didn't run well against Tougher And then you get the big drop in class To claiming to the 8,000 claiming level And that's kind of a wake up call right there You know, you finish second, you run pretty well that day Now you step back up to 16 But it's not, it's not it doesn't bother me Because I know he can compete with this group on his, on his best level. Um, even a horse like El uh, Asino, who I would I wouldn't want to completely dismiss. Um, it, he may be one of the shorter prices, and there may be a, a, a few other speeds in here that might not make it completely easy on him. So I kind of like where you're going with horses that can sit. I even threw the five sharp art into the mix. Um, I thought sharp art. He. His last start, he was he was slow, but he recovered well, and then he was sitting in a good spot in third. He was tucked in nicely, and they just had zero response. Sometimes I think that that might mean you put yourself in a good spot, and you're just not good enough against that group. He's proven at Churchill. He's run well at this trip. He could be a little more relaxed maybe with those blinkers coming off. Um, and then I, I guess we'll mention Silver Ride at least because the barn has just been rolling. Diodoro, <laughs> they're having a, another quick start um, at this meet after an awesome Oaklawn meet. And the, they ran into Town Champ last time Who got really good at Oaklawn Park We just kind of wonder which silver rider are we going to get If he shows up with one of those efforts Like he, he showed uh, you know, in January and into February They're probably all running for second in here If he shows up with one of the efforts that he's had in his last couple He, he, he sure doesn't have to win So, I mean, good, good exotic races, Sean They're like this when we can definitely make strong cases Against the horses that will probably be favored And make Cases for horses that are going to be, you know, from six to 12, 15 to one. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I absolutely would not dismiss the seven silver wide. I would watch the tote board on that one. I mean, so good point. He, he's kind of hovering the second and third, you know, the between the first and the third choice, right? And second between the three to one, and the four to one. I, if this horse drops quickly, I would, I would definitely include this horse. And I, if this horse drifts up, I think we've, we've got our answer. Yeah, and then even, you know, even like the two stay home I'd prefer the two over the one You'll probably get a little better price with stay home And stay home has actually shown that He doesn't have to be so far back He has some races where he can get a little closer So, yeah, I'm, I'm taking a swing against Cowboy Cormor for sure in here Sean and I like a, a few different between, you know, Spike Shrill, um, Ladies Weekend, Sharp Art, Silver Ride Those might be the four maybe we can kind of key in on And, and maybe in, in some of the exotics in that fifth race as we move to race number six, which is the start of the late pick four, these are ten thousand non-winners of two in here. And just from a a wagering perspective, Botero probably going to be tough in here, coming off of back-to-back runner-up effort or back-to-back efforts where he just missed. He was third beating neck and then second beating the neck. Seven furlongs probably a good distance for a horse who's won going uh, six and a half. Is probably a good distance for a horse who's won going seven furlongs. Um, I guess I'm less. I'm I'm less willing to try to beat him than some of the others in here. Where do you stand with Botero? Yeah, you know, I, again, this is this is the horse to beat as opposed to the last race where you know we didn't really think the favorite deserved mm-hmm. to be the favorite. This is definitely the horse to beat. Yeah. My question is, why is Martine riding? Um, doesn't seem like his go-to to Brad with Brad Cox. So that's a little interesting to me. I thought the eleven and the twelve, um, you know, had had some value. The eleven's coming off back to back. Long layoffs came back in December of, uh, you know, laid off in December 2017, came back in August 2018. Now we've been back and now we're off since September 18th, uh, 2018. So, but both times the first start has been the best start, or I'm sorry, the first start off the layoff has been the best start of this yes. horse's career. So, why can't that horse? And we're going to sit in that kind of stalking position right outside the 10. Right. So I, for me, I, I, that horse adds value to me at 11 to one. Again, I would be looking at the board. Um, but uh, my top pick was the 12 to uh, proven to kind of stick around at this level. Always been around, always been competitive. Um, 
And then uh, again, we're going to set that tactical trip. So I don't want to be stuck on the rail and have decisions that have to be made. Do I need to send because people are coming from the outside? When you're from that outside post, you can go and you can clear or you can kind of follow that horse that goes. So for me, I, I like those kind of trips. I don't, you know, I don't need a horse that has to be on the lead. And then we break a step slow and my ticket's basically you're screwed. Dead. Yep. And then you're done. <laughs> yeah. And, and what's nice about Lance Mitten too, the 12 who you were mentioning so the race, uh, you, you break your maiden for maiden 12 fine last time out. But you look back at that March 29th race when you were behind Sea Lover and you were just trying to see like how good this horse is. There were three next out winners in that day, in that race that day. Sea Lover came, uh, came back to win a first level allowance at Tampa next out and then an open 25 claimer. So that's a legitimate animal uh, that beat him at Tampa and that came back to, to win in tougher spots following that. So Lance Mitten has kept some decent company. And I think with that kind of speed drawn to the outside, a horse that you have to use in. Uh, in a lot of your exotics I'm going to mention two bust out long shots That if some of you want to use them In your late pick fours, pick fives Maybe at least in underneath spots That they can perhaps spice things up for you The first one is going to be the four Chapel barn So this is a first. Time, this course is going to go as a first time gelding now And you look at the barn statistics And you see Brandy Steele is like 0 for 7 on the year This is a really capable barn They've hit it 14% over the last five years I love when a horse that has some tactical speed routing Cuts back to six and a half or seven furlongs That elongated sprint And that's what happened in the last two starts For Chapel Barn who has been going longer at Oaklawn And you know what? Neither of those races are that bad You look and you see that this is a horse Who was beaten double digit lengths And people probably go, ah, he was crushed But dig a little deeper into those races He was fifth and then he was fourth On March the 28th, he had a good start He was four wide into the turn He lost a little bit of ground He then moves up in the four path He gets to within a couple lengths He makes that move He's up to second prior to the top of the lane But then co-worker opened up and then he fades And kind of a similar type trip on on. Uh, May the 9th or, or April the 9th It's a nice start He's tracking inside He's third He's a couple lengths off He's tucked in He's chasing a lone speed winner Wrath He kind of moves up Makes his bid And then he tires late Wrath opens up So he's facing like lone speed In a couple starts He makes his bid And now he's going to get a big cut back I don't know if he's good enough To compete with maybe Botero If Botero shows up at the A game Or maybe the Hork you, you mentioned Even the Sheik of Araby Who has like probably one of the better A games Of anyone in this race but as far as uh, sitting a trip and maybe falling into a spot, I thought the four at a great price, and maybe even Sammy's Dream are horses to include in your, you know, Exactus, Tri, Supers. I'm going to throw them in on, on some of my pick fours and fives. Um, Sean, we have Sammy's Dream, who was a debut winner sprinting on the turf at Canterbury. And then that second race he ran, going a mile at Del Mar. That actually was a pretty good race It wasn't bad at all against first level allowance Optional 80s in November of 2018 Then he's off from November to April Of 2020 He breaks well but so do four other horses In that race he gets hooked up in between He's got no shot Then he drops second off the long layoff He adds blinkers he's heading into a barn That's really good with with New acquisitions I just think you could do a lot worse for 20 and 30 to 1 shots Than the two horses we mentioned So um um, let's hook some of them up with your 12, um, Lance Midden with the, the 11, the Sheik of Araby. Botero's probably the one to beat in here, but I think this is a, a very fun, exact to try super kind of a race. Yeah, absolutely. And just to touch on what you, what you had talked about is usually when we get to this kind of level, we kind of know what horses are. And with the eight, uh, the horses only had three starts and candy rides can run on any surface. Plenty of so, upside, right? Yeah, twenty to one blinkers on candy ride. Yeah, absolutely. Should be a little forwardly placed. Um, so a sixth race where I'm doing a little fishing, fishing for some prices as we move into race number seven at Churchill. Uh, this is a good race on paper. We got a first level allowance, mile and a sixteenth on the turf course here. You might have a ton of horses that are like four to one in, in this race, and an interesting horse who's been. One that we've followed along now for the last year and a half is a horse named Scabbard, who initially was racing at, at named Noose. His name was changed, and he had some trouble in the Iroquois. He was a horse who I'm, I was very high on in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, and a lot of people were. And he was just a little flat that day. Okay, that's fine. That's a track that a lot of horses didn't run well over. But he's not really progressed and taken a step forward from two to three. Now they he's a he's gonna go as a first time gelding. And he's going to try turf for the first time His dam never tried turf but he did have a sibling win On the green where do you stand with Scabbard Trying the grass for the first time 
Uh, you know, it, again, this is kind of all going to land on price. I mean, when you start seeing the, you know, Breeders' Cup Juvenile, the Risen Star in his past performances, what is this horse? What do you think this horse is going to be? Five to two? Yeah, yeah I was going to say maybe seven to two. He'll be whatever he is. It's less than what he should be. Correct. First time gelding, first time turf. I'm I'm looking somewhere else. I really like the eight Lebec. Um, I think I'm pronouncing that right. Yep. Uh, I mean, no, nothing. I'm not trying to knock uh, Karen McLaughlin at all, but first time Mike Maker, the guy just owns the turf. First time going like long on the turf. This is bread and butter. This is exactly I mean, where he excels. We've got a nice work tab leading up to this. Yeah, it's a little bit of a break, but with what's going on right now, like I, we don't really know what his plans were for this horse. I feel like the horse is spotted right. Um, and eight to one off and we're not, I don't feel like we're going to get kind of the natural mic maker pull down to like five to one because of, like we said, with scabbard being in the field, I feel like some people are going to gravitate to that. So I'd be happy with five to six to one on this horse. Sure. I have Lebec picked second. I'm going to have Lebec in all of my exotics here. I completely agree with you. You just put a line through that September 2nd race on the Saratoga slop. And sometimes it's just like crossing a race out to, to really look at the form and go, oh, wow, you have a string of, you know, some really nice races. This horse has not done really anything wrong on the grass. I think Lebec needs to be on all of your exotics tickets. The one other horse that I'm going to probably use with maybe Lebec on my top tier of horses is the five moon over Miami. Now the the price will be key for him too. I don't I, I hope he doesn't get bet down a little bit, but I think we can get around around five to one or so on him. Uh, Sean man, after he won his maiden race at, at, in his second start, I thought this was a really, really nice horse. I thought he was getting ready to take the next step and maybe be one of those three year olds to watch. And then he, he ran into New York traffic. He was really wide. It, you know what? Bill Mott didn't mind. He still took a shot in the risen star after that with him. And then he took a shot in the grass, which was a really tough spot because Moon Over Miami was 25 to 1 first time on the grass in that stakes race. He ran into Decorated Invader that day. And you know what? He he ran into a tight spot. He lost some ground. He moved through the field. And what I liked is, you know, people will see eighth beaten four and not much. Watch the end of that race. Once he finally got a little bit of room. He actually closed some nice ground I think there's some ability here with Moon over Miami He hasn't been as consistent as I've been hoping I think that he's the type of horse That might be able to just jump up With big performances here and there Maybe not string three or four together I'm hoping this is the day he puts one together I'm with you against Scabbard I'm completely fine with taking a shot against uh, against Scabbard And uh, I absolutely love Lebec So what do we do with Sea of Hope? Drawn to the outside Who... Got his prep kind of out of the way He hadn't raced from May of 2019 to May of 2020 And he didn't run that poorly It was a race that was taken off the grass Now he gets back to the green um, How are you approaching using him exotically? So, I, you know, I, I kind of think of it In the way that you had said about You know, he got his, got his prep race out of the way Off the layoff But when I look at it Was it really a prep race? This was only That's two point. weeks ago It was only two weeks ago And it was supposed to be on the grass it was an allowance, non-winners. I, I feel like that was the spot they wanted to go in. And then when it scratched off, they felt like they were still in a good position, which they probably were. For me, at 7-2, to two, I think I think like what you were saying, people are going to kind of gravitate towards that horse. Oh, it's, you know, second off the layoff. They're going to see that stat down there. But we don't even have a registered work after that. Um, for me, there's just too many question marks on, on, on that horse. And I kind of want to circle back on what you said about Moon Over Miami. I think this is... Very important on why you need to watch replays because if you look at that horse's race on the pay on paper, the yes, there were quick fractions to run into, and the comment line says no factor. But this horse was running, and like you said, had a strong gallop out. And now we now we're stretched out to you know a mo- another 16th of a mile. I don't know if that's going to play on a factor, but I feel like on paper, you're getting a different opinion than if you would have watched the race. Yep. Completely agree um, Counter offer from the inside is another one Who, who kind of got his race out of the way Maybe he can save some ground And uh, he makes his third start of the year He's finally putting a couple starts together He wouldn't be a complete um, a complete shock uh, Mantra is another one who um, Was on in that same race with, with Sea of Hope They actually dead heated for third that day They both should probably enjoy getting back to the grass But I think you made a great point on Sea of Hope Like I look at Mantra Coming off a layoff of just Two months much different than I look at Sea of Hope coming off a layoff of over a year When horses come off layoffs of that Long I generally would love Them to have like a month in between Races 
Maybe because sometimes you run hard or you get a lot out of that race. I'd like to see just a little more time spaced. If this race was one week later, I would probably be a little higher on Sea of Hope. I'm not completely against him, but he might for sure be more into my exotics than coming back a little quicker than I'd like. Yeah, I mean, even just the work on um, on the sheet, you know, as far as the register work, mm-hmm. see how that horse came out of it. Cause you, you can look back at the form and say, okay, 48 and one, 48 and 48 and four, 59 and four. But now this horse comes back and runs 52 and change at four furlongs. I wouldn't say something's wrong, but the horse is tired. Yeah. You know, or, or at least that would be the opinion that I would develop. You just want to see a little bit more to, for a horse that's, if he was, and the same thing, if he was six or eight to one, it doesn't bother you as much. When he's as Correct. when he's seven to two, because you you kind of build in when you you're looking for horses that are prices, you got to kind of build in the fact that there are some reasons why those horses are prices. You know, um, good point on Sea of Hope in race number uh, seven there at Churchill Downs. As we move to race number eight, which is the start of the late Daily Double, and uh, we're gonna get to see a nice return. This is what racing is nowadays, huh? After um uh, the things being canceled for a while and all sorts of race um. Schedules being shifted, stakes schedules, some of them being eliminated. We're going to see a horse like Gorana making her debut uh, for 2020, making her return to the races on just a Thursday afternoon. Um, this is a multiple grade one winner, and she did not a whole lot wrong uh, last year, Sean. This is a, a very, very nice animal. Yeah, I mean, it, it's she's she was definitely something special last year, and I'm really looking forward to uh, watching her run. This is kind of a race where, you know, it it really depends on what I would be doing as far as either betting or contest. But as far as betting goes, I would I would be taking the race off and and watching here because I really think that she's going to be something special. And I touched on earlier that there might be showers in the area, and so that might be a time where you play against the three to five. Yeah, but look at how she broke her maiden, crushing in the, the slop. slop. <laughs> yeah, so. I mean, for me, like, I just, I don't see a lot of holes to punch in this in, in you know, in, in her form. Um, I would love to see her draw off just because as a fan of the sport, I just want to see it. The big stars, um, yep. As far as betting goes, though, um, I thought the nine had a look at least underneath. Because if you got to think the pace is going to be hot, you can't let Gorana go. Um, other horses are going to try and press the pace. And what's wrong with the with a late charging closer that has turf or that has a wet pedigree underneath? We only have one start on the form, um, a second place finish. We have that four fifteen wet pedigree, and we've got we've got form, you know, kind of backing it up that sh- uh, the horse should like the the off track. So as far as underneath, or even if you want to play something small, um, that that would be my pick against the favorite. But I'm, I'm all in on on the six as far as wanting to see her win. I I think there's only one horse in this race that could beat Gorana if Gorana ran like like maybe her B game and or like B minus to C game and wasn't quite 100 percent and I think that would be Sunny Dale um, who might be able to steal the race if she were to able to get in front of Gorana maybe Gorana just wasn't quite cranked up 100 percent for this and the seven furlongs maybe kind of a tricky distance to return to. But uh, the things you mentioned, like she's already run well in the slop. She's already won at the tricky six and a half furlong distance. So it shouldn't really be an issue for her. Um, I just think that Sunnydale got really good. And if you look back at Sunnydale, she's actually strung together a really good, you know, string of seven or eight races. And then last time out, she got crossed over on early. She was behind the leader. She got, she was tucked in. She got shuffled on the inside and you were talking about this trip just a little earlier. Like that's it sometimes for a speed horse. You get that trip, Mm -hmm. you get shuffled, you've got no shot. And maybe the plan with her today is, Hey, let's just gun this horse. Let's gun this Philly. Let's see if she's quicker. And then Guana, maybe we can get out front. I think she has a type of a race that she can call to that race at Del Mar behind first star. I get nightmares of that one. Cause I bet her, I bet her that day at eight to one. And I, I, she opened up by a few and I thought she was home free. Um, but she, she has some ability. I just, I'm kind of with you, Sean. I don't know who even with their best efforts would be able to compete with Garana. I think you mentioned a really good horse, Bohemian bourbon to use underneath in some exotics. And then, I mean, obviously lady Subi is kind of coming into this race nicely. She should be set up for better, Coming off of that race behind me and mischief, where she did, um, she did actually finish third. And the horse that she ran by late to finish third was Bellafina. So no shame in, in running by Bellafina late for Lady Subi. But if Gorana shows up, Sean, they're probably all going to be uh, four or five lengths back running for second. I'd say. 
Absolutely. I mean, if she if she even runs her B game, I don't think she's going to be beat. But the key, key thing to keep in mind, um, if you like trainer angles, didn't Lady Subi tr- scratch into this race from mm-hmm. last weekend? Yep. So um, while, you know, maybe she's running for second, um, you know, that's something to keep in mind that obviously Sadler and the Connections wanted this spot rather than the last one. We get to race number nine, trying to close things out on the Thursday card at Churchill. Made in $30,000 claimers, seven furlongs the distance. And the thing that um that I looked at right away at first glance is, you know, you're looking through this field, and there's a first-time starter for Brad Cox that, that looks pretty solid. And you, I, you just wonder, like, I, I imagine this horse will probably get some action in this spot and, and won't be 5-1 to one like we see, because this is the type of horse who... And like you said, I don't want to say there's something wrong with in the morning, but I, you would figure a horse like this, a three-year-old son of Cairo Prince, they would at least take a shot at against in a maiden special weight race or two. I think the fact that they're showing up immediately for 30 kind of tips the hand a little bit. Maybe they're not – this isn't a, a 100% animal that looks quite as good as, as he is, Kid Shaleen, because on paper, you're looking at a barn that's good first out. You're looking at a good pedigree. You're looking at a good steady tab of works. So this one would be a, a very live one to look at. I just there's there's something a little weird to this guy when I look at him, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so I treat uh, maiden special weight, you know, with first time starters a lot differently than I treat a maiden claiming race, especially mm-hmm. big barns like Brad Cox. So when I'm looking and I see a bullet drill or 47 and change, a minute flat, um, in a maiden special weight, I, that horse to me is is ready to go. In a maiden special weight out of the Brad Cox barn with Tyler Gaffleon, which is exactly what we have right now. But you're taking a, a hundred thousand dollar purchase out of the Keeneland September sale with those bullet with those. They're not bullet works, but they're still solid works. Steady but if works. You dig, yep. If you dig a little bit deeper, that's when the slower works come in. So I think mm-hmm. uh, for me, those are four sale signs. Yeah, I agree. The, the, I the think quicker so too. works are for so. I'm looking at that. So when I when I look at that, I'd look straight to okay, well, what horse has kind of proven themselves? And I jump back to the two. Uh six to one Shaw. Yep. We're dropping out of maiden special weight. We're coming from Gulfstream Park. So it's not I'd say I mean it's not a huge deal, but we're still up for the tag. Um, we get Joe Talamo. And we're going to kind of sit that stalking trip. Cantharos, you know, uh, a horse out of Cantharos, I feel like is gonna kind of lean towards sprinting and um and so they they went the mile two back and i feel like we're we're back to kind of you know we're back to our friends um back to our friendly competition the yeah the the two i think is one that i'll for me i it was like you gravitate right towards that first timer just like you said but you have to use like a different set of set of glasses when you're handicapping a maiden special than versus it than a maiden claimer because you have to start Using the intent of the trainer into it more than just what's on the paper, right? We got to dig a little bit deeper than just exactly what we're seeing on the paper. And you make a great point there. This is a horse they paid for a hundred thousand for. They don't even take a shot in a protected spot. They're immediately in for thirty. This horse can win, but I think playing horses like this in the long run, you're better off taking shots against them, especially if they're at prices. Hey, if this horse is seven or eight to one. That's probably not a good sign either, but you, you don't have as much to, to knock. I'm assuming that this horse is going to get bet to about five to two or so, and, and then we're probably going to be wanting to look elsewhere. What's wrong with the horse like the nine first citizen who y- you see that race last time out against maiden 40s where he didn't run all that well? You know what? He had a fine start. He was right with the leaders, but there were four or five other horses who all wanted to go for the lead. So he ends up sitting third, and they are flying up front, I mean, they go 46, uh, 69 to the, to the half mile. So they're really, really rolling along. And he moves up to second, but he's just all in at the top of the lane. Um, he was just, I think, much too close to that really quick early pace. Now you get that cut back. Seven furlongs feels like a distance that should hit this guy right between the eyes. He has some speed. He can sit a little bit. He's still pretty le- uh, relatively lightly raised here. And, you know, if he repeats an effort of that May... Uh, March the 5th race at Oaklawn Park That'll be right there And he probably is a 5 or 6 to 1 shot in here For a barn that we don't know a whole heck of a lot of about So maybe for Citizen in here You mentioned Shaw um, We're both kind of against What it, what the intentions are for the first time starter Kid Shaleen Anyone else today that we want to discuss in here? Well I kind of touched on it earlier About the possibility of showers being in there And and, and that again Like you said if we run back to March 5th with the 9 that's good enough to win But how about December 8th The, the 19th 
a maiden special weight on the muddy track. So we've kind of proven that we can run on the main track. Yep. And then to jump on top of that, we've got the six out of Distorted, Distorted, Distorted Humor and Empire Maker bred for the off track. These are ones that I would include if there's moisture in the draft. And and I would much prefer a horse like the six. Uh, if we're just talking about the first time starters in here, like the six and the seven, to me they just feel like two totally different animals, right? Like the six, I just feel like is uh, like this is probably where he belongs. This spot with Alstall Jr. Whereas Kid Shaleen probably belongs here, but they probably had bigger plans for him to begin with. So I feel like they're two totally different horses and how we're approaching them in a, in a fun ninth race. So I think what. What we've seen now, what makes a sequence good, Sean, is when you can find multiple races throughout, whether it be a pick three, pick four, pick five, where you're saying to yourself, I'm not going to use the, the horse who's probably going to be the, the betting choice. I'm not going to use the horse who might be the second betting choice. I might be against the, the top few, and I've got a horse that's in, just like you said when we were having a conversation before we even looked at the races, that's in that like eight to one range. I feel like we've got a good amount of them on this card uh, at Churchill on Thursday. Yeah, I definitely think there's some uh, some beatable favorites, and that's kind of what you need to do when you're looking at the card. Is you know any, anybody can bet the you know the even money, and you know unfortunately that the rate they win, you're going to lose money in the long run if you do that. So you know you got to kind of try and find some value. You got to punch holes in the form of certain horses, and that's kind of like what we were talking about with Lady Guarana. He would love to beat a three to five, and you know we're talking about the chance of an off track, but unfortunately that horse has that. So in a sense like that, you just kind of have to move on and look for those those horses that we talked about in that kind of price range where, yeah, you're getting value, but you also feel co- confident in in the horse's chances. Um, like kind of going back to that uh, the eight in the in the seventh race with Mike Maker at eight to one. I mean, for me, that's that's kind of like a single in hundred percent spots. A separator, so I can, it's a separator single. Yeah, I mean, and, and we were talking about a few different horses in that race, up to probably four or five of them. Where if other people are going four or five, six deep to catch that horse, and you're singled, well, now you can not only fit in your bankroll, but you can also find value elsewhere. And on top of the eight to one that you just got. That's a race where, you know, counter offer, scabbard, Botswana taps, moon over Miami. Um, they're all going to take money. Mantra is going to take money. Sea of Hope's going to take money. And then people might look at Lebec and say, eh, you know, maybe needed a race. Uh, maybe come, hasn't raced since October. We know Miker can get them ready off the uh, Maker can get Miker. Did I say Miker? I can buy Mike <laughs> and Maker. <laughs> we, we know he can get them ready off the bench and first time in his, uh, in his barn. So, um, man, yeah, I, I like this sequence. I thought it's very approachable. And if you're the type of person who maybe you're not playing on a huge, huge budget, you might feel like Guarana is a free space for you. Maybe that's a race where you can single. And then the other races, you take approaches where you're going against the, the favorites, kind of like how Sean and I discussed the sequence out. It just feels like, you know, sometimes I think a lot of the players, especially if you're a smaller player, you open up on what's a really good day of racing and it can be a little bit overwhelming. You're looking at race by race and you're going, Oh my gosh, I'm going to have to use four horses here for how big is my ticket going to be? And people start like getting a little, I don't even know if I can play this. This feels like a playable sequence. You have maybe a spot to key in on and maybe a couple other spots to beat some chalk. Absolutely. Uh, like you said, I mean, uh, Corona, we kind of both have leaned on kind of more of the free square. Um, and, you know, with prices, they could still pay. Um, I've seen plenty of pr- plenty of sequences where, I mean, what, what is Corona going to be? Probably one to five. Yeah. I've seen sequences like that where it pays, you know, anywhere between 500 and a grand. And sometimes more if you can beat a lot more favorites. There's some short prices in these sequences that, you know, both you and I have punch holes in. We didn't even handicap the card together. Sean Alvarez, awesome man This was a lot of fun, I hope it's the first time Of many that you and I sit down and handicap Some cards together here And um, let the folks out there know Who follow you, where can we get you on social media What are some of the things that you're going to be Working on coming up, I know you're doing some stuff With the Racing Dudes um, And and give us some of the other uh, places where, uh, where we might see Some of your work yeah, um, so I'm doing um, some freelance articles with Racing Dudes. Um, the nice thing about them is they're basically just giving me freelance and uh, whatever I'm passionate about. So right now I'm doing a little bit more contest plays and I'll, I'll ramp up a lot more as kind of we get to back to whatever sense of normalcy um, our future holds. Uh, outside of that, I'm kind of gearing towards contests as, tr- as tracks are racing up or gearing up. Um, I'm looking at the uh, Express Bet contest this weekend, trying to feed into that. And just on top of that, just kind of sending out feelers and seeing where I can be most helpful. And where can we follow you on Twitter? 
I am at smooth turn two. And uh, the two is the number two smooth turn two. And I will say great follow. Um, he not only will give you information on you no know, handicapping horses he likes and stuff. He'll help share other good shows, podcasts, other good links to uh, other stuff and just a, a real nice guy To interact with on there and, and as you mentioned You're not just a horse guy too you love all sports And um, and hopefully we're, we're Hearing some of the, the words that it looks like NBA maybe towards the end of July Football looks in good shape um, NHL we'll see if baseball can, can agree On something so we might have uh, Some of our sports back sooner than later Sean Yeah I'm really looking forward to that I, I mean there's, I, I couldn't even Pick one I just want them all back I mean We want to we want to we wanna watch uh, Watch those games I'm, I'm as much as I like watching uh, the 1988 World Series on repeat, um, I would <laughs> We're love ready to see some, some live games. <laughs> We're ready for some current now. Absolutely. <laughs> um, awesome stuff, man. Sean, I really appreciate it. Thanks again, and uh, I look forward to having you back again on That's What G Said uh, sometime soon in the next coming, uh, coming few weeks, and we can talk some more racing. All right. Thanks, Gino. I appreciate you having me on. Folks, don't go anywhere. We're going to take a quick break uh, on That's What G Said. Really fun talking with Sean for the first time Hopefully the first time of many We'll uh, like to have Sean back a bunch here To talk some races with us I just want to quickly go through some of my plays at Churchill For those late races uh, In the fourth race, the number 8 ever clever lady I'd use the 8 along with the 6, 9, and 10 In some of the exotics But the 8, or anything around 5 to 1 Let's make a win wager the fifth race, that's the start of your late pick five. Make sure to throw the uh, the five sharp art onto some of your tickets. Um, I would include along with, you know, three, four, seven, and eight in some of the exotics. I'll, I'll give you a couple pick five approaches um, at the end here. Um, in the sixth race, a couple long shots to use. Botero, I respect. I think he will be in the mix. But the four, Chapel of Barn. The eight, Sammy's Dream. And then the ten, Lance Miton. I think I will use those. Along with Botero in the exotics Try to hook them up in exactas, tries, and supers The seventh race, the number five Moon over Miami with the number eight Lebec, I'll use those two in all exotics In the eighth race, really comes down to What do you do with Guarana She looks like a standout single um, And she looks like she should Tower over this group, I think you know, Sunny Dale is would be the other one to maybe include on some of your other exotic tickets. And then in the ninth race, the number nine for Citizen, I'll include along with the two and the four. So a couple pick five approaches for me in this Churchill card. In uh, that fifth race, we'll start and I'll play one ticket where we'll go all with four, eight, nine, twelve, with five, eight, with Guarana singled, with two, four, nine. And then the next pick four, pick five ticket will be uh, four five seven with four eight nine twelve with one three five eight ten with four six with four nine. So a couple of different pick five approaches there at Churchill Downs on Thursday. Again, a big thank you to Sean for helping us out there. We're gonna close out this episode of That's What G Said, talking a little billions. We're gonna recap episode five and. In episode 5, we we start to get a little bit more into Axe's childhood And we kind of see a little bit more of uh, of this monster known as as Axe and, and we hear a little bit more about his dad and how his dad was, uh, you know, abusive And, and uh, how he would take it out on him and take it out on his mom And how Axe would try to, you know, direct and divert the attention away from his mom So that way his dad wouldn't, you know, fight with her and this is really what drives Axe, you know, the thinking about the twelve-year-old Axe in Yonkers and his dad and and not being successful and not having any money and his dad, you know, being able to to control him. We then get Taylor and Wendy. Um, they're deciding on if they should be keeping or firing some of the employees now because they're going to be transitioning Taylor Mason Capital into now a, an impact fund. It's going to be t- Taylor Mason Carbon soon. Winston, one of them, is a pure numbers guy. He doesn't really seem to fit with their new, you know, message going moving forward. Uh, Chuck and Kate, they go to try to to block Axe from getting a bank. Remember, Axe is all set. He's trying to get a bank, and they go to meet with the woman who is in charge of the bank approvals, Mrs. Calder, and they ask to stall and deny his uh, Axe Axe's bank application. Chuck does not want Axe getting a bank. They speak. With the woman who makes the decision And she um, And they tell her You know Chuck says Hey you know Whatever you need If you need to help I'll help you You help me She's not really interested In this kind of Quid pro quo But 
She she says all of Axe's stuff looks fine. She actually wants to give Axe a bang. But they're able to kind of finagle some information from her. Her son's ex fiance won't give back the family wedding ring. This is a family heirloom that was smuggled out of Germany in World War II. It means a whole lot to the family. And Chuck says he will get it back for her. He says, but just deny Axe that stall application, or deny Axe that bank application, stall on the application, and they end up making a deal. So then Axe and Wags and the lawyer go to meet about the bank. They think they're in great shape. They've already been talking to this woman, and she said everything looks good. And then they get in there, and she denies the approval. She gives their the bank uh, another bank the charter, Vark Community Bank. She says they have a greater need for it. She tells Axe he needs to find a squeaky clean, legitimate CEO. And that's when they realize that someone has gotten to her and has turned her and made her change her mind a little bit. Axe is then warned by uh, his reporter friend um, Randy from the journal that there's a hit piece coming out on him. Because remember, Axe last week, uh, on last week's episode, he skipped out on the dinner with Savion and his family. He was supposed to go to have dinner with Savion and his mom. Axe ends up leaving because he's all upset. He can't. And we find out more now why. We're wondering last week why Axe could, decided to leave and not go have dinner. Because going in that house. Where Savion lives, which is the house that Axe lived in when he was a kid, which is the house that Axe was abused by his dad. He brings back all these memories, and Axe couldn't do it. He couldn't bring himself to go back into that house. And so now he's got to try to squash this hit piece that's coming out about him because if this story comes out that he was only there for publicity and for BS and. He's not going to have an opportunity to get that op- The opportunity zone And this could screw him over in, in his attempts to get a bank as well So Wendy and Taylor They're interviewing new employees And they uh, they bring one in She's got an algorithm to get resources for women All over the world where they are needed most Companies, she says With biodegradables um, That are just waiting to be funded She calls this the taco algo She's funny, she's sharp um, she looks like she's going to be a new fun addition to uh, two billions. Wendy and Taylor then discuss partnership numbers. Wendy says should be fifty percent. Taylor offers ten. Wendy says to make it worth it. So they're going to have to have a little song and dance about um, what are the the numbers are going to be for their newly found partnership. McPhee and Winston, some of the employees of Taylor Mason. Capital now carbon They're worried about their jobs They're a little bit worried about Wendy And what she could do And what her real intentions are We then see Chuck Who's finding it tough to get that ring back For the new deal that he needs He has an idea though He wants to meet with Jackie Condy Brian Condy's brother Who is a I guess a, a genius when it comes to picking locks And Chuck makes a deal with Jackie Asks Jackie to help him get this ring back And Chuck will move Brian Connolly To a closer, safer prison And he will also get Jackie off of A, a massive uh, GTA Grand Theft Auto uh, Charge That he has So Jackie agrees but he says Chuck has to go Visit Brian and, and, and see him there uh, Next scene we see Axe and Savion They're playing pool, they're discussing a contract Axe pays Savion who agrees To keep quiet um, but he actually calls Axe out and tells him to quote unquote fuck off. <laughs> he he recognizes this behavior from his dad, and Axe is kind of taken back. He uh, I think he kind of respects Savion for telling him to f off. Lauren and Wags are looking for CEOs for Axe's bank. This has to be someone who is, you know, squeaky clean. They want clean people who are willing to get dirty when needed is uh, is the quote. Wags doesn't like any of the candidates. They don't jump off the page to him. Then Axe meets with his some of his crew and uh, they all went to the Vork Community Bank and they filmed a scene where they a couple of the the guys pretended to be gay so that way they could film and see that they were given higher interest rates. They were also minorities. So they set this whole thing up to where they could catch the bank for fraud, xenophobia, homophobia, and racism all on camera. <laughs> Axe loves this. They they set up a sting. They filmed it all. 
It was great. And then they sent in dollar bill afterwards to show that the white guy would get a way, way lower interest rate. Lauren and Taylor discuss Wendy. They discuss what percentage they should offer. Lauren questions her loyalty. And we see uh, Wendy and the artist Tanner. They start to, to flirt. He calls her and he wants her to come in and look at some of his new paintings. Chuck, as requested, goes to see Brian Quantity in jail. And Brian walks in to see him and just doesn't say a word and just punches Chuck with one big swing, which is just a great scene. And then immediately he's taken back into his cell. So when Axe is in Yonkers to try and scrap the story, he goes to see his mom and he asks her to talk to Savion's mom. He he then also wonders where uh, Alexis that he bought his mom is. She said she sold it. Axe doesn't think that sounds right, so he he calls his people to to check in on it. It's funny that Kate, remember her uh, relationship with with Brian Conady, she's very flirty with Jackie Conady. As they plan the heist and how they're going to get the ring back, he presses her to hang out. He ends up speaking Italian to her. You could tell she likes him a lot, and uh, she's trying to to hide it. And the artist takes Wendy to see some of his work. He he very much likes her, and he tells her that he can see she sees more than most, and being around her makes him feel a lot. It exposes him. He wants her opinions. Taylor and Lauren have dinner and they continue to talk about Wendy and how she is, Taylor, you know, says super smart, the top 1% of the 1%. Um, and when it comes to people smart, top half percent of the half percent. And Lauren thinks that Wendy might be screwing with Taylor and screwing with the company, tells Taylor to cut Wendy in. But to limit Wendy, Lauren says about 15% is what what uh, Lauren would do. So uh, Wendy and the artist go to a job site that's about to be demolished. They seem to be hitting it off. We just kind of see them um, getting a little flirty. And then we flash to Chuck, who is having dinner with his new girl, um, Kat, who's discussing his sexual appetite. And as Chuck's dad is playing with his new baby girl, he seems to be in pain. He falls over. He faints. He's rushed to the hospital. And this time, Chuck shows up with Kat Bryant. And Wendy shows up with the artist. Wendy's already at the hospital with the artist when when Chuck shows up. The hospital had started calling the emergency contact list, and they ended up getting down to Wendy. So it's really awkward with um, Chuck and Wendy and their new, I guess, sort of significant others who awkwardly say, "Uh, we should probably go outside here. They find out that Chuck's dad has kidney failure, and he will need a kidney transplant to survive. But he's told because of his age, his liquor intake, his cigar intake, he is ineligible to be on the donor list. So he's starting to freak out a little bit, a man who doesn't seem to worry a whole hell of a lot. Jackie Conady gets the ring, and he goes by Kate's to give the, the ring to Kate. They have a drink. Kate has a few drinks, and then boom, right into the bedroom. Get down tonight. Kate is ready to get down. The story about Vark Community Bank has been released. They are now closed. They have been crushed. And Axe's boys celebrate. And Axe buys a new suit for the reporter Randy, who helped him um, keep the Yonker story off off the, the market and who helped him release this story. Axe's mom didn't end up selling the car, Axe finds out. She gave it to Axe's dad, who went to California, who got chased out of there for bad credit, went to Arizona, had a business, then filed for bankruptcy, and then came back to see Axe's mom. He's just a bad dude. He's not good with money. He's dishonest. And now Axe's mom is talking to him again, and she gave him Alexis. So Lauren is talking with Wendy before Wendy and Taylor make any deal. And Lauren's kind of aggressive. She's trying to set a message and send a tone. And that's when Taylor walks walks in and offers Wendy 40% of the company of their uh, for the deal. And Lauren does not like this, but she said, once you guys make the agreement, I'm going to go all in. I'm going to hope I'm wrong. They all end up making a deal. So it's Wendy and Taylor together in this new Taylor Mason Carbon. Axe goes to see his mom. She said that she felt bad for his dad. She saw him at a bus stop. He couldn't find work or get around. And we know he set it set it up. Sure, right? He's a scumbag. Axe then 
goes very intense here. And he, he threatens his mom. He says if she ever talks to his father again, Axe will cut her off. He then has the Lexus picked up from his dad's and squashed to a cube and dropped right back in front of him. So Winston, who's been trying to figure out what he specifically does for Taylor Mason Company, he lets Wendy and Taylor know how he is able to help them in ways nobody else can and and how he's worth. And uh, there's some fun chemistry between him and the newly hired employee, Ryan, who he actually refers to as Gal Gadot's quirky sister. Uh, Wendy at one point tells Winston he's too needy. And Winston responds and says his first and last girlfriend told him that also. So this is a fun little scene uh, and, and some little back and forth where Ryan actually stands up for him, the new employee. She says that his differing opinion as a capitalist douche will actually help them be a more well-rounded company. After not finding any CEOs that he loved, Wags wants to be the CEO. He has been in – he did a banking program in college, so he has the experience needed. He will step down as COO of Axe Capital, and they go to visit Mrs. Calder. They let their – you know, the, the Vork Bank's done now. They, they should have no issue getting their bank, but she won't give them the, the bank charter. And so Axe knows someone has turned – her and we know that it was Chuck who ended up getting that ring back for her so Kat goes to see Chuck Kat and Chuck's who's, uh, whose date night was ruined the night before when they had to rush to the hospital for Chuck's father she said she doesn't mind the family drama and then uh, we see them get get together in the evening and pretty soon they're just having plain old regular old fashioned sex which isn't what Chuck really likes right so Maybe there's a, a level of intimacy that, that he's sharing with her that he never had with uh, with his previous wife, Wendy. So Axie's Savion, and um, and he has Savion and his mom moved into a new house. And he tells Savion to never let his dad back in no matter what. He says, Savion, I may never see you again, but if you ever need anything, um, call me if you're ever in trouble. And Axe does not want anyone to ever live in that house again, the house where his dad abused him. Wendy and Taylor have a welcome party for Taylor Mason Carbon. And while Axe is in his childhood home, uh, in his room at Savion's old home, Wendy goes to visit him. And Axe is struggling. It's stirring up all these old feelings. He tells Wendy how, you know, when, when he was sitting there, he would try to distract his dad from, you know, abusing his mom and hitting his mom and. The episode ends with Axe and and Wendy watching his dad struggle through the remains of that crushed car. Axe is just kind of loving seeing his father struggle after everything he did to Axe. And Chuck's dad is in the hospital struggling. He is in critical condition. He needs a new kidney. He he needs Chuck's help getting his name put onto the, the transplant list. So lots moving forward. I thought it was a really good episode of Billions this week. Episode 5 of Season 5. That's going to do it for us, folks. Thank you again for tuning in to That's What G Said. Thank you to David Aragona for talking some Belmont with us. Thank you to Sean Alvarez for talking some Churchill with us. We'll have a fun episode coming up a a little later on in the week. I believe we're going to be reviewing... Summer uh, Survivor Series 1992 with Darren Zocali with Andrew Champagne. We'll continue on with any news in the worlds of baseball, football, basketball. We're going to recap some of the wrestling from in the from earlier in the week, and then we'll also focus in on the weekend horse racing. I think it's going to be Emily Gullickson joining us from Optics, and it's going to be Craig Milkowski talking some stakes races from around the country. A huge show coming up later in the week. Don't forget to subscribe so you'll get every episode delivered right to you. Joey Cleveland, take it away, my friend.